And welcome back to the DATEF Challenge Roth, powered by HEP. As we've said earlier today, what a spectacular day. As you can see, more and more of our age group athletes making their way to the swim start. We have 13 waves all up of individual races here today and three relay waves. As we take you now live onto our bike course with our professional men, we do know that they are already hitting speeds of 60 kilometres an hour plus. Uh, we have a lead group of seven, including the likes of Patrick Langer. Now, we haven't spoken too much about Patrick Langer yet, but honestly, uh, definitely one of, the, one of the top athletes to watch today. Yeah, big time favourite. Uh, a course that I think suits him. He's, his bike handling is great. Uh, you know, as a rolling course as well, and he's a, he's a slight sort of guy, so uh, I think he's going to enjoy the hills. Um, and his, you know, his plan is just to sort of probably stick near the front and uh, save it for the run, where it'll be exciting to see how fast he can run. And of course, he was the 2017 and 2018 uh, Kona winner, Ironman World Champion. But this is his very first time here in Roth, so his first start. And I know he was very, very excited to be lining up here today. Now, he has a, a marathon record of 2.36.45, so we know that he's a, no slouch in the run, one of the fastest runners, really, in the sport of triathlon. Um, but he's also solid on the bike. Yeah, he is. He's a strong rider, and I think he's even said that this year. He's, he's worked with a few other athletes to um, just you know, really lift that cycling. And uh, he, he was disappointed last week at, at the Collins Cup. So I think he really wants to prove something today. Um, and, you know, he is, he would say so himself that this is his distance. And uh, I think, you know, I don't think he's going to sort of, he's going to get off the bike in a group. And uh, I just hope that we see a bit of a, a, a bit of a running race with whoever he's with. And he was fourth uh, earlier this year in Challenge Grand Canaria, which was won, of course, by Jan Fredino. He absolutely crucified them in that race uh, it was uh, it was it was picture perfect really that race for him uh, but fourth place for for Patrick and it, he was on the comeback so we know that he has improved since then and of course last week in the Collins Cup had a little bit of a mishap at the end of the bike but still you know had a solid race yeah I think and that's the great thing about the Collins Cup he was racing for his team and uh, you know maybe on any other day he would have he would have just pulled the pin there but um, he, he carried on in a way, he got a good sort of last training session in for for this weekend, and 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 Roth for him was a uh, you know a late addition. So uh, it's great to have him here. He did also win uh, Ironman Tulsa earlier in the year, and uh, that was an absolutely amazing result. A great field there, and just um, kind of took them to pieces to be honest. With a, a great all-round um, day as he usually has, and just a super fast marathon. So it'd be good to see how he goes today. Of course, great image of our professional men back on the course now. And of course, we did mention that the bike is a little short this year, 170 kilometers due to some extensive road work taking place on the course. And let's go to a little bit of an update on the COVID measures that they've had to uh, employ this year for the race to safely go ahead. So for the athletes, the only difference is that we actually have a different bike course. Um, that is partly because of COVID. We cannot host Solar Hill with 50,000 spectators on one spot. But it's also because we have moved the race, because uh, we are very grateful towards the government, because what they do is that during July, when the race takes place, there is no construction site, uh, road work at all in the county. They all start two weeks after challenge. So now that we have postponed, all the roadworks have started, and now we are in the midst of all the roadworks in uh, September. So we had to adjust the bike course. It is slightly um, uh, less than 180k, about 170. For the volunteers, it's going to be different because they will have to wear uh, gloves. Uh, they will have to wear um, FFP2 masks. Uh, normally the bars are cut in middle for the athletes to easier take it out. We cannot open them. Um, so there are few uh, changes on the uh, volunteer side, but overall it's, it's a doable question. And we are back at the swim start. Great shot, fantastic shot of the canal. Really beautiful swim conditions here today. The sun has started to come up. Slightly a later a race start than normally. Normally this race starts at 6.30. They had to push it back to 7 o'clock start for our professional men, purely because it just wasn't light enough. Of 
course, the race is normally in July and now being in September, it's just that little bit darker in the mornings. But sitting here in the race shoot finish, it's absolute glorious day here today, already starting to warm up. We did start with a bit of a chilly morning, 10 degrees Celsius, but it's already warmed up to about 14 degrees C. And we do know that it's, that temperature is going to continue to rise throughout the day hitting a high of about 26 degrees, uh, but not till uh, towards the end of the day. So uh, from most of our races heading out onto the marathon later today, it's going to be absolutely beautiful conditions around 23, 24 degrees. Uh, there's no wind at all whatsoever at the moment. So it's going to be super fast times on that bike course. Uh, we do expect the wind to pick up just a little bit on the second lap of the run. Of, excuse me, of the bike ride. But for now, it's really, really fast conditions out there. We've been given updates out on course that we do have a lead group of seven professional men. Uh, we do know that Philip Bulk is leading the way. He's a young German. Uh, he is pushing the pace out front. We know that Braden Curry is also in that group, uh, pushing the pace right behind. But all of our men are out onto the bike course now. We know our women are also out on to the bike course. We will get an update on our professional women shortly. As we can see that our professional men, as we've mentioned, two lap bike course, 170 kilometers this year, that 10K short due to the roadworks. Uh, we will not be taking you up the infamous Solaraberg this year, purely because they can't get to the Solaraberg because of the roadworks in place. But you can see this bike course goes through several, several towns. I, I do believe it's about eight to ten towns per lap that they will be going through. And you can see already from our camera positions that it's quite technical through these towns. And uh, you, it really does make a difference if you know the course. Yeah, absolutely. It's such an engaging course. Um, if you're having a good day, it's quite fun to be out there and all the twists and turns and ups and downs. So it is... When I was here in 2013, I wasn't having a great day, and I remember thinking, God, when do these twists and turns end? Um, so the guys out there having a good day, day will really enjoy it. We have been given an update out on course that Ruben Sapunkta, our Uber bike rider, is in eighth position. He's riding solo, about 30 seconds behind that lead group. So like we anticipated, it won't be long before he joins that lead group. We did anticipate that happening. Uh, obviously, being a former pro cyclist, he can close the gap pretty pretty quickly. Uh, then 37 seconds after that, we've got Andreas Dreith back in ninth position. So Andreas not quite in contact with that first with that lead group. As you can see, our lead women out on course today. We know that is Fenella Langridge leading. She led the swim from beginning to end and is now out onto the bike course, leading the women's race here today. We know Annie Haug is looking very, very strong in second position. So already getting herself into a great position. Annie Haug, the fastest runner oh, in the field and great to see her already in a second position. Right, While well, we get a great shot of Fenella Language there on her bike, we're gonna to go to a short interview on the tactics that are gonna play out today in the women's race. I know the course pretty well, uh, and so just knowing, okay, now I'm in this part, now I'm in the, like this part of the loop, you know, it really, I think, breaking it down and not having this big picture, like you can't think about the whole race in front of you because it's just too overwhelming. I think in the longer distance racing, it's good to have a process for eating and drinking and timing your effort um, because it keeps you engaged during the, the race. So uh, for me, I'm always looking at what I could be doing next as a process um, during the time and it, it actually makes the time go faster. And I think that when you think about how long of a day it is, it can be really overwhelming. And so for me, the, the way that I approach it is I just don't even think about how long you should be aware of the distance. I mean, uh, I, I did a lot of um, middle distance races now and you shouldn't go the same pace because it's a very long day. So you shouldn't be too much distracted what all the other people or athletes uh, around you are doing. You should focus on yourself, listen to your body. When I'm at a mile 100, I just think about 
try to stay as present as possible and think about eating and drinking and staying within my power zones and just trying to race my race versus really thinking about how long the day is. <laughs> I think the bike's all about just being patient and sensible. It's a fantastic course here. Even this year there's been some changes due to due to road routes and stuff, but it's still going to be an amazing course. It's there's some super fast sections. I think it's hillier than most people realize when they get here. I just get on my bike and I start going through what I need to do to get to the finish line. And welcome back to the studio with Dylan McNeese and myself. Just a little reminder that we do have a little bit of a social media activity if you want to be a part of it. You can write in your questions and videos and uh, we will be able to answer them for you. So if you've got any questions that you would like to ask either about any of the athletes, the race itself, um, feel free to write them in and we will do our best to answer all of them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, keep them uh, PC would say in New Zealand, please. Uh, but yeah, happy to answer any questions you guys have out there. So, so send them in. All right, and uh, we do have another special guest joining us here on stage in our little booth today. Uh, while I would love to have seen her out racing, it is great to see that Imogen Simmons is uh, here with us. Now, of course, Imogen Simmons is sponsored by one of our big sponsors here today, HEP. Uh, so great to have Imo on stage. She's about, hello, I can already see a hello, Imogen. So she's about 10 seconds away from joining us, but it would be really great to have Imo here with us both. And she can give us a little bit of her expert opinion, particularly on the women's race and how she sees it panning out today. Well, hello, 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 hello. Hello. Now, firstly, thank you very, very much, Imo, for joining us. I feel like I just want to reach out and give you a big hug, but, uh, We'll do this instead. <laughs> um, Imo, first of all, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Like this is insane to be here. It's a bit strange being here on on the other side of the of the rails. I won't lie, but it's inspiring to say the least. And I'm very excited to to see how the day pans out. Now, I just mentioned earlier, I would have loved, loved, loved to have seen you on the other side. But but we'll take this anyway. It's great to have you here with us. Uh, what are your thoughts so far? I mean, what what a race! It's incredible. I was even yesterday when I walked in, I was surprised at how much of an expo there was going on and how how much activity. But it all feels like very controlled, and you never feel in any way um, in jeopardy or like in an unsafe situation. So, well, hats off to Felix for organising it and getting it through. So that's pretty exciting. Do you wish you were racing? I mean, <laughs> I mean, yes, but like the last Ironman I did was just three weeks ago, so possibly no. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, and it was a great result in, in Finland, wasn't it? Yeah, so in you're Finland. Ha you're happy yeah. with that? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. It was, it was a cool race. It was probably a couple of weeks too early for me with respect to where I was um, preparation-wise, but it was awesome to race, get that Kona slot, and then um, now I've got since Kona has been postponed um, the rest of the year to kind of enjoy and choose a couple of other races and do those. Do you have any plans? What is what is the next race? <laughs> <laughs> the classic question. Yep. Yeah, I mean, every I think everyone, every triathlete always has a few uh, few plans in the back of their head. Um, yeah, so hopefully get uh, another chance to do an Ironman before the end of the year. So, yeah. Great. Um, I guess everyone's asking, so who are your picks for today? Ah, men's or women's? Well, let's start with the men. See, they're up on screen right they now. Are on screen. Oh, so um, I saw a few of them at the pool yesterday evening, actually, and um, I have to say, there's a, a confident air that's surrounding Patrick. Obviously, um, he looks like he's in front right now. He so is. He's, he is indeed. He's Good eyes. Taking there. the lead on, um, taking the lead on the bike, which is awesome to see. So hopefully he can uh, deliver that through. But honestly, the field is stacked. And if anything, I've learned from Ironman racing is absolutely anything can happen. And that it can, that it can. And <laughs> we're, we're, we're really only in the, sh oh, the, 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 the beginning stages of the race here Yeah, today. that's absolutely right. Like, we're so early on. And um, I think Sebi Kine's form has really come along as well recently. So as you mentioned earlier, he's got that Achilles niggle. But I think he's, from what we saw last week in Shamarin, he's running pretty well again so well very well again so it'll be cool to see um see if you can bike through the field and the women 
Ah, the women. <laughs> oh, um, I, I'm impressed by Anne Haug's swim coming out of the water with um, so Fenella. Fenella, that's right. Fenella was first out, and uh, we do we have been given reports out on course that Annie Haug is currently in second position on the bike. So that's impressive to see. Um, I I struggle to see like the both of them are extremely consistent racers. So I do imagine that they have it in them to hold those positions. Um, depends on what's happening behind, who's ends up working together if they're able to. Um, so I'm not sure who came out of the swim behind them together, whether if, as you said, like Sarah's got some people around her. I mean, if three or four people, three or four girls are together, it can completely alter the dynamics of the race. So that'll be interesting to see. Now, there's been a question I've been dying to ask you for some time. Obviously, I know you very, very well from Phuket. You, you spent a lot of time there uh, training under Jürgen Zak. You've had a change of coaches now and you're obviously with a new coach back in in uh, I was going to say Sweden back in Switzerland <laughs> um, and back in Europe again uh, what's it been like has it been a big change for you yeah it's been uh, it's been a big change There's, I mean for everyone I think COVID-19 has made a lot of people review their situation and have to adapt to the various circumstances so for me it meant um, moving back home and to be honest, loving being back in Europe. It's awesome. Uh, complete change in team. <laughs> <laughs> complete change in team. And yeah, it's. Um, I feel very much at home and good with myself in where I am at the moment. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, so I've had a few injuries, so that kind of instigated having to change quite a lot around. And um, I think, you know, every athlete well not every but sadly the majority of athletes go through those kinds of injuries and it does mean you have to reassess your situation question a bit like what you're doing and if it's the right the right way forward and so that really has led me to to make some changes and it's cool to to be at home and I think I would have struggled without being around family during this time so that's really been like having a strong support system around me has really been invaluable but yeah I mean I think a lot of athletes have been injured during this time and I mean for me it was I didn't have access to a physio for a month because we weren't allowed to which is completely ridiculous but there you are so and new coach Rito Brandley I mean obviously I know Simone Brandley quite well and uh, how's it been with the new coach it's awesome yeah so it's um, it's it's fascinating really changing and I feel like there's so much I've learned so much from Jürgen it was an amazing time together and it was awesome to be in in his training group out in Thailand but having a chain in coach is so much more to learn and you really opens your eyes up so and very happy yeah and HEP we know that HEP is one of your personal sponsors it's also one of the major sponsors of the race here today can you just give us a little bit of a talk what what they are who they are what are they trying to do so <laughs> where do we start <laughs> where do we start <laughs> so yeah so it's um as as it's powered by hep um hep are um, a company which produce uh, solar power through their solar panel farms they got um, farms all over the world in five major like uh, countries including the US Canada Japan Germany and the UK and um, so it's investment groups that care uh, people can invest in the company to produce sustainable energy essentially oh, that's fantastic and what a, what a great initiative and what a great what a great family team to be part of it's certainly a family yeah it's it's awesome that the families of HEP and Roth have kind of challenge have kind of partnered up because it, it works beautifully mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. no I totally agree I was very very excited when uh, Felix told me that they were coming on board because it just seemed like a, a beautiful synergy between the two absolutely yeah and as you can see, we've just got an update out on course. We, you are right, Patrick Langer is leading, but we have Braden Curry up there, as well as Nils Fromhold. So all of the main players up there. We don't have Sebi Kinlay up in that lead group right now. Um, has, uh, there was another one, Andy Dreit and Ruben Zapunke, have they, so have they no, tagged they, on? They, no, they haven't. So they ha they're not up in that lead group of five yet either. We have the young gun, uh, Philip Balk. We, we're hoping we're saying his last name correctly. But uh, it's a difficult one for us. Me being the, the Aussie and the, and the Kiwi, our, our, our pronunciation of some German, acts, of German names isn't perfect. I'm, I'm from French Switzerland, but it looks, it sounds so you're good, no good to, to me. Either, I'm then. sorry, I can't, can't help you much there, but Balka sounds pretty good. 
So, yeah, well, he's one of the young guns and he's having a great race. He's up in that lead group as well. But the likes of Ruben Sapunkta, we know he's not too far behind. Last call, he was about 30 seconds behind and, and catching. We, and did, we did just have Ruben on camera. Um, it looks like he's really making up some ground. So, And we did get an update. Sebastian Keenel was five minutes behind out of the water, which is about where you maybe expect Sebastian to be. So uh, he probably would have wanted that to be a little bit less. But this is where he gets to work. And... Uh, you know, this is not a new position for him. No, it's not. And, and he's, yeah, it's, as you said, it's something he's very, very used to. As we see a, a great shot of Sebi Kinlay out on the bike course there now. Now, Imo, next race, can you tell us where is it going to be? Um, Europe, obviously. I mean, isn't it great that races are going ahead in Europe? Yeah, it's fantastic. It's awesome that they're all happening. The questionable weather is making some of them slightly so less enjoyable, but I mean, aren't we lucky today? Um, so I'm heading down to the south of France to do Aix-en-Provence, which was actually my first ever um, half distance race. Oh, fantastic. So <laughs> wow. I feel like I'm kind of coming full yeah. circle. So there oh, you that's are. brilliant. That's brilliant. And you're right. I mean, when we first got to, well, when I first got to Europe last week, along with, with Dylan, there were a few questionable days there, but Honestly, could we have asked for better conditions for race day today? Uh, no, it's all, it was chilly at the race start. I won't lie, it was 9, 10 degrees when they were hopping in the water. So I think they were grateful to have those wetsuits on. But um, yeah, it's, uh, to be honest, I think it's going to be a day where one of those days where all the weather we well, go the through all yes. no, well, we go through all the weather moments as well. Like there's the chills in the morning and then it's baking hot because that run course is pretty unforgiving. Well, they did say 26 degrees high today. Mind you, I'm sitting here still in a puffer jacket and jeans while you're in shorts and a T-shirt. Yeah, well, I won't tell you about the, the five-degree lake I got in on Christmas Day this oh, last year. No. Oh, not for this soft Aussie. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to the sun sort of coming up a bit higher and I can take my jacket off and get, get a suntan before I go back to New Zealand. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad it's a sunny day for sure. Um, and look, we got your picks obviously for today. What's the plan for the rest of the day? Are you going to go out on course, out onto the run course and, and uh, cheer for all the athletes or any plans for the day? Yeah, sure. So um, there are a group of us from the HEP team here who are um, providing like kind of insights on the Instagram channel. So we're kind of stationed all over the um, the course. So follow along if you want some up-to-date news feed. Obviously, you've got your feed as well. So that's giving live coverage but we're following all the field so that should be good and yeah cheering the athletes is awesome to be to be here to be in a, the tri hub again so it's crazy well as you can see the stadium at the moment is completely empty and it's really quiet but i can tell you without a doubt that by about 1 p.m today it is going to be packed and that the music's going to be cranky so we hope to get you back here later on this afternoon fantastic and it'll be great to see you again thank you yeah good luck to all these guys out racing and everyone who's hopping in that water because I think they're going to have a fun day out there. I do too. Thanks, Imogen. Thanks, Imo. Thanks, guys. Good luck. And, of course, that was Imogen Simmons, one of the rising stars in the sport. Uh, still very, very young and definitely very, very young when it comes to full distance racing. But I have a feeling that we're going to be hearing a lot more of the Imo's name in the future as she's one of the strongest uh, young up-and-coming athletes that we have yeah, absolutely. Some great results already this year, but I think there, there's more to come by the sounds of it. And, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, seeing her, her results at the end of the year. You can see great shots of our men's race as we go back to Sebi Kinlay on course. Just looks so good on a bike, I have to say. Beautiful position, beautiful cadence right now. He's on one of the fastest sections of the course. Normally this section where he is now is really, really quite windy. You can see it's very, very exposed part of the course. But today, I don't think there's any wind out there whatsoever right now. He really does just look like a man on a mission at the moment. Perfect position, good cadence. Um, he has refined his, his setup a little bit over the last couple of years, and I think he does look slightly more comfortable. So uh, he's just um, powering away, and I'm really going to be interested to see those time splits when they come through. Like you said, he's, he, it is a position he's used to being in. He, he does, he knows how to chase. He doesn't get out of the water in first place, so this is not something that's foreign to him. 
He knows how to get down and get it, get to business. But it was great. I did I did bump into Tina the uh, two days ago and got to meet little Nino. And of course, I've got a little bit of a, a lesson. He's, it's Nino Kaimi. And I said, well, what does Kaimi mean? Of course, it is Hawaiian for the seeker. So I thought that was a pretty cool, pretty cool second name. I think Sebastian's middle name is could be the seeker too. So and he's definitely doing that at the moment. And this is uh, this looks like Ruben. Uh, leading the bike at the moment so he's he pulled in those 30 seconds pretty easily and now Very he looks quickly. like he's, he's got a chain chain of uh, athletes behind him and this is actually re reminding me of the time when cam Worf was here obviously cam Worf has raced to roth a, a couple of times and we saw him do exactly the same thing at the beginning of the bike and it didn't it wasn't that he did anything outrageous he just rode rode his own right race out in front and you just you we started with a pack like this of about six or seven, and one by one, you just saw them pop off the back till there was one athlete yet left, which was Sebastian Kinley. And of course, with about 30 kilometers to go on the bike ride, he even decided this is just too hot for me. And of course, Cam Worth was able to come into T2 on his own. And I see similar things happening here today with Ruben. Yeah, you know, they're still early in, in the ride, and uh, you always start a race with, you know, matches to burn, and it's just how many you have. And a lot of those athletes, their goal would be to hold on as long as they can and hopefully they can hold on for the whole ride. Um, it doesn't sound like the smartest tactic but when you're in there racing no matter how much you tell yourself this is the pace is too hot, the pace is too hot, it's just so hard to, to let, let go. let them and, go, that's right. And, uh, so I can see a few athletes there definitely popping off at some stage. Actually, that year that I was talking about with Camworth, Jesse Thomas was also here. And I remember him saying he, tr he just wanted to stay as long as he could. He knew he was doing the wrong thing and he knew it was going to be to detriment uh, of his race. But he just thought, no, I just want to stay here as long as possible. And I think he was able to stay for a good 90k, so the first lap. And then, of course, the, uh, the elastic band broke and he popped off the back. I remember thinking that, but Jesse's also an amazing rider, so... Uh in the way he was third that year wasn't he, he was. so he, he had you know, a great run it did did well for him and um it's important to remember that you can blow up on the bike and still have a good run so a lot of these athletes are just thinking if i can hold on as long as i can and get off the bike in a better position then uh hopefully my run legs are there and and have a good run too and that's a fantastic shot of the bike course we saw any Haug then on screen i have to be i have to be honest in a position that i didn't think she'd be in already i mean in, right up there at the, at the top of the race for the women, right in the position where she wants to be. And we know that if she is able to get into T2 uh, within, you know, earshot of, of our leaders, if not in the lead, she is going to be absolutely impossible to beat because we know that she's running very, very well. Yeah, and she's also a great rider. So I, I can't see too many athletes sort of uh, pulling her in and overtaking and getting a, a decent enough lead to outrun someone like her. Um, Maybe Kim Morrison is, is one of the, the best riders in the sport and she, she could uh, definitely ride time into them and then, uh, and then carry on. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see. You can see up on screen now, we still have Fenella Langridge, our swim leader, still leading. We know Annie Haug is not too far behind and Rach McBride in third. So a great swim and a great start to Rach McBride's race. Great to see her up in the top three right now. And going back to Annie Haug, we know that Unfortunately, earlier this year when she came over to do Challenge Miami, she uh, tested positive to COVID and she's had several complications since then. One including, um, it's a rare form of type 2 diabetes that you can get post-COVID and took a little bit of, of time to diagnose, but it really did um, create a few problems for Annie, um, including feeling very, very fatigued in training and actually having, she said she just felt like she needed to sleep all day long. Yeah, I think that's uh, um, kind of known uh, symptoms. So uh, yeah, it's, that's, I, I didn't actually know that. So that's, that's good to hear that hopefully she's, she's on top of it. Um, and you know, diabetes kind of affects your energy levels and stuff. So uh, yeah, glad that she's back on top of it. And by the looks of it, she's, she's not going too badly. Of course, she had a terrific run leg last week at the Collins Cup. There's really no one out on the field that looks like Annie when they run. She's just a, she's a beautiful runner to watch. Yep, absolutely seamless. And there's a, there's a bit of a video clip of her passing someone last weekend and it, it's a little bit cruel to be <laughs> it honest. Was, it was good. <laughs> and, and we know that all the women running last week were running ridiculously well, but 
you know, Annie runs past them and it makes them look like they're standing still. Yep, and she'd probably do that to me at the moment too. So, uh, yeah, she's a great runner and, and at the moment in the absolute box seat here, just uh, leading the race and, um, and with those run legs. Uh, at the moment, she's going to be hard to beat. And, of course, 2021 season so far, she had a win at Challenge St. Bolton. She was second at Challenge Walshie, only beaten by the like Nicola Spirig, who we know uh, was in, or still in great form this year. This is her very, very first time here in Roth. So great to see Annie here and she's been, she's had a smile on her face since she got here. So it's been, she's in really good form. She's in a really good place and a really good mood. And yeah, I think she'll be very, very happy where she is right now in the race. Yeah, no, for, for a lot of them, they, they had Kona on their mind. That was their big goal after the Collins Cup. Yeah. And uh, a lot of, you know, I was speaking to Braden, go back to Braden. He, uh, he was really down in the dumps there for a bit. Um, he, he almost didn't go to the Collins Cup, almost didn't come to come to Europe so uh, for these athletes to then get this chance to race here at Roth is uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah it really is and uh, yeah, you can see Braden, Braden he, he just wants to race he loves racing he, he trains hard but he, he races even harder and we go back we can see our lead male obviously Ruben Sapunkta racing very very well right now this is the position he would want to be in uh, let's just have a look at a little preview we did on race tactics with the men today. Going onto the bike um, is obviously uh, the longest part of the challenge run. I remembered the first like 120k, they just flew by like nothing. Um, and then uh, it, got, it got harder and harder towards the end. I do think this course is fantastic. It's uh, broken up quite a lot by small towns and different surfaces. For the bike part, it's great to break it down the whole distance. And for me, it's also very helpful if I know exactly the course. Especially here, you have such a beautiful bike course. It's rolling hills, it's also smoking fast. Um, it's, it's well known for its fast times. I, I'm thinking until the next corner, until the next town. I have some, especially here on this course. Yeah, the course here, it tends to go by pretty quick, but uh, you know, when you're four hours into a bike ride, it always gets challenging. Um, but for me, uh, you know, just a few simple um, keys that I use uh, throughout the race, just to relax and smile and um, to eat. And of course, with knowing that there is this wall um, that you're gonna hit at one point, sometimes you tend to lower your speed a little bit that you're not hitting that wall that hard. But I'm not planning on doing that on the weekend. It's uh, one shot, one opportunity. Um, so therefore, um, I think I also have to have to use my strengths on the bike to, yeah, try to make an advantage over the other guys. You know, it's going to be a long, long stint, a long time in the same position. I think, uh, especially with all these little uphill sections, but then also long and fast downhill sections. Um, it will just give the, the athletes, hopefully, the feeling of flying, and that's what I'm aiming for. Um, go as fast as possible and uh, enjoy the flight. All right, that was an update on the tactics that the men are going to be using out there today on the bike, as we have a great shot of Ruben Zapunkta leading the bike today. We've been given updates out on course that he is really starting to wind it up and push the pace. And it is causing some of the athletes to really start to falter behind. We know Nick Castellin is starting to find the pace just that little bit too hot. And we might have word that Andy Dreitz has joined that lead group. So he's one that will not hang around there. He'll go straight to the front, I assume. And uh, will be will be really good for uh, Ruben actually to have some to ride with, I think. No, that's right. We have been given an update that, that Dreitz has been able to join that lead group. So it is now a lead group of, li of nine. But there are a couple of athletes that are looking, looking like they're struggling just a little bit off the back of the group. We know that the draft rule today is 12 metres, so it is the 12 metre rule. We have lots of officials out on course, making sure that it is a fair race for all. Just an update, send in your video greetings via WhatsApp and be part of our live stream, so send them in to us. Of course, if you've got any questions to ask, you can do that too, and both Dylan and myself will make sure that we answer them as best we can. 
And of course, we spoke about the 12 metre rule here, but we know that if, if there is a drafting call, if one of the athletes is, uh, does incur a penalty, that it is a four minute penalty uh, in the penalty tent in T2. But on top of that, there is also the extra one kilometre that they must run at the beginning of the marathon. That's just, that's nasty. There's some nervous looking athletes in that group and fair enough too. Four minutes plus an extra 1k is not something you want to uh, to get uh, at any time. So um, especially in a big race like this and, and the feedback we're getting is the athletes are looking a little bit nervous in that group, just making sure they're keeping the distance as best they can. I can tell you now, 42.2 kilometres is long enough. Uh, I don't want to be running a, a metre longer, let alone a kilometre longer, right at the beginning of the marathon. No, absolutely not. Um, so, you know, it'd be nice if you, if you raced fair, maybe you got a kilometre taken off, but uh, that would be too much to ask for me, I think. But uh, That would have suited me. Yeah, so no, hopefully, hopefully no, um, no penalties today. All right, as we can see, our lead female, Fenella Langridge from Great Britain, having a superb race out there today. Great to, to see her doing so well. I'm just going to go to a quick commercial break and we'll be back with you shortly. everyone who loves adventure. For everyone who makes their dreams a reality. For everyone who aims high. For everyone who maintains a clear view. For everyone who keeps family close to their heart. For everyone who refuses to compromise from head to toe. We protect you. Anytime, anywhere. Protecting people. Now available online. uvex groupshop Successful companies produce a lot, like this, like this, or something like this. In any case, they produce that. Numbers, a lot of numbers. Because with success comes a growing commercial effort. What entrepreneurs need is good software from DATEV. Because we create connections, fast, secure, future-oriented connections between the data in the enterprise, the tax consultant, and every party involved. As one of the largest IT service providers in Europe, DATEV creates connections for sustainable success. Wie wird unsere Welt von morgen aussehen? Vor dem Klimawandel können wir nicht davon laufen. Wir müssen ihn aufhalten. There is no planet B. Invest in solar energy. And welcome back to the DATAF Challenge Roth powered by HEP here with Dylan McNeese. And we are back with our men's races. We get a terrific shot of and Andreas Dreitz, Andy Dreitz, who's had a stellar race so far. He was a little bit behind coming out of the swim, Dylan, but he has well and truly made up that gap now. And he's actually pushing the pace on, pace on that lead group. Yeah, he's, he's definitely stretching it here. You can see that gap's opened up. Someone did just pass someone else. That could be Nils Fromhold maybe closing the gap a little bit. 
Um, the reports on course are that Nils and Peter Heimer were looking really comfortable. So uh, I, I'm excited to see how these guys race. You know, they haven't had the best of seasons so far, but Nils being a, a previous champion, he knows how to win here. And uh, if that is Nils, he's closed the gap pretty easily to Andy. So uh, that's good to see. No, it really is. And, and an update on the women's course. We know that Annie Haug is now leading our women's race, so she has managed to overtake Vanilla Language. They are still fairly close together. We know that Sarah Crowley and Rach McBride are also up there. Unfortunately, we did get given reports that Rach made a little bit of an error and uh, went the wrong way on the bike, but was able to turn around, get back on course fairly quickly. So lost a little bit of time there. But one of the big movers in the women's field, which is great to see, is young Chloe Lane from Australia. Now, Chloe Lane, not a lot of people would know about her outside of Australia. She's coached by Cam Watt. He's got an incredible stable of, of female athletes who have all been racing really, really well. Renee Kylie last week uh, had the race of her life. Um, in Hamburg but getting back to Chloe Lane she is riding very very strongly out there on course and is in that uh, that second group uh, there's a second group of five and she's really pushing the pace in that second group and great to see Chloe having such a good race. Yeah I don't know too much about Chloe but that result in Cairns was would have been a massive confidence booster for her and you know when you're a young athlete and you haven't done too many full distance races everyone sort of helps and counts and you, you learn a lot each time, so um, be really exciting to see how she goes today as well. And, and uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't count her out of a, a top five position. No, and of course, this is her first time over here to Europe uh, and first time definitely in a Roth. And I remember when she contacted me not so long ago, it was a little bit of a, a little few complications to get from the US to, to Germany, but really, really glad that she persevered with it and made it here because I think it's a great, great learning experience for her. And, I think she's just very, very excited to be here racing. Yeah, not not easy to get over here from Australia or or New Zealand for that matter, but it's actually quite a bit harder to get home. So very brave move, you know, coming over and racing. But, you know, you get one shot at these kind of things and uh, it's really cool to see her that she's committed to this and uh, and having a great race today. No, definitely, I agree. Right, we've got a little update, a little uh, doing our Facebook uh, update. So from Jay Mack doing a great job, Dylan and Belinda, thank you very much. That's always good to hear. Plea, uh, great to explain various parts of the race. Good point because, you know, with this particular, with this bike course, as we said, there are so many different sections to this bike course. You don't really have that many long, pure time trial sections on this course. There's probably only two or three that come to mind. But a lot of the time you're actually up out of the error bars and weaving in and out through all those small little towns with, with a lot of blind corners. Yeah, there is. And there is some actual quite key key parts of the bike course from what I remember. Obviously, Slaraberg, now that it's gone, although it was awesome, it wasn't too key. You know, it was not the longest of climbs. Um, but there is a big, long climb earlier in the, in, in the race that I remember that's where I actually got popped, I think, on, yep. the, on the second lap. Um, and then up above on that on that uh, that first climb, there's a kind of a flat, really exposed section that, if the wind does come up on it's that terrible. second lap, mm. that's where I think we'll see a lot of um, athletes kind of start start dropping off on the bike. Uh, after that, you have quite a nice sort of descent. Um, I think that's where, where Frodo, Frodo crashed. Had his little mishap. Uh, yeah, and then uh, you do wind through what I call more of like a, a slog section where you felt like there was a bit of a headwind, kind of false flats. Um, we really have to work hard. So there's, there's plenty of really fast um, parts of this bike course, but there's also bits that you really feel like you're working quite hard, and that's when you want to be having one of those, when, when you are having one of your good moments and not, not your bad. Now, it's really interesting you say that. I, I remember racing back here for the very first time in 2004, and, of course, I came in as a wide-eyed, didn't really know what I was doing, and uh, I, I, even though I did have a good ride that year, and obviously cycling was my strength, I just felt that there were so many sections of the course that I could have ridden faster on if I had have done my homework and my research and knew the course better. So fast forward to 2005 when I came back here, uh, I know Justin, my husband, made me ride the course. We came months in advance and he pretty much made me ride sections of the course every single day. And I know by the time I, I lined up in 2005, I knew that course inside out, back the front. Yeah, this is a this is a momentum course, and if you know the if you know where you're going, and you know the corners coming up and the hills coming up, you can really use that momentum through those parts and 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 make it a really fast day. 
And as you can see by the footage that we've got on screen right now, super fast surface as well. Like the, 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 the tar here is really, really fast. Yeah, uh, typical German roads, just perfect, um, perfect sort of, perfect and smooth. And yeah, it's really up to you to make sure you're going fast. And another great question from Stephen Emanuels about the swim, and I absolutely agree with him. Um, he said he had his fastest swim here back in 2016, and he was wondering whether it was because he was sticking towards the shore. And you are dead right. So as I mentioned earlier, the whirlpool effect. So often what you do is you swim up in the middle of the canal, but when you come back, you're better off swimming right over to the shore. So right over on the other side of the canal where it gets where it gets quite shallow. And it definitely has a fast it, it definitely is a faster swim when you stick over there. Took me a few took me a few years to work out the fastest parts of the course. Um, but yet you're definitely right. And if you can get that right, you will have one of your fastest swim times. I know I had my fastest swim time here. Yeah, and it's it's people might think it's short, but it's not. It's spot on 3.8 kilometers. Um, just really it's a really just a big swimming pool and you can imagine if you get this, this this cycle going like that it is like a big whirlpool and so if you're if you're one of the third or fourth wave for example then um, you're going to get you know towed along a little bit sucked along exactly right um, and there definitely is tactics with the swim and I always used to think well what I need to do is just follow the Germans. They know this course better than anyone else so just get on get on one of the good German swimmers feet and feet and stay there. And let's go down now to a recap of our swim here this morning. Of course, our kickoff time was 7 a.m. with our professional men. And then at 7.03, our professional women. And then we had our age group starts happening behind them. 10 minutes back. It was a, a stunning morning, almost a little bit moody with the mist there. Um, water is about 18 and a half degrees, so wetsuit swim. Um, I think the men kind of surprised me a little bit. Bigger group to start with. Uh, but it did sort of, the pace did sort of uh, pick up a little bit through the swim um, and we saw Nick Castelline lead out, uh, lead out the men. Yeah, beautiful swim conditions down there today. We have Luke McKenzie out on course and he said it was crystal clear, absolutely like smooth as silk on the water as we can see our lead men coming into T1. Some great swims. So great swim there today, some fast times overall as we go back to our men's race, down on race course, on the bike course. Andy Dreitz still out in front. And it looks like the, the, tra the train's still there, so people are hanging on. They're likely burning some of those matches I spoke about earlier. Um, but, you know, you never know. Um, Andy is usually a rider that can ride off the front. Uh, just depends how long, and he's not going to keep trying all day, so... Uh, I think um, in the next 30, 40 k, I think is when uh, the critical time will come, and Andy will decide whether it's worth a, a big effort or whether he maybe just sort of backs off a little bit. And we can see that the men now are—they've just—they're just at the top of greeting. That's that big climb that you did talk about, and it is a—it is a steep climb. I know that it, I had to always get out of the saddle on this climb. And so all of our seven men still together, still looking really good. We're getting reports out on course that no one really looks like they're struggling. So while Dreitz is leading this race, that group of seven are looking pretty comfortable there as they are making their way to the top of greeting. It's quite a cruel climb. It, it zaps all your speed early on, really steep at the start, and then it kind of levels off. But it's just, um, yeah, it's one of those evil climbs that if you can get up over that first steep bit, then you can carry the momentum over the rest of the climb. Well, let's just take a, a closer look at the profile of greeting. At first glance, travellers may not think of the small town of Greeting as a tourist spot. What's the first thing you think about when thinking of Greeting? A uh, petrol station? Greeting. Well, taking a break. Good question. Service area? I just got here. No idea. But there is so much more to the town at the southernmost tip of the bike course. Something Barbara Fussin, who likes to dress in traditional ways, is very keen to stress. Grading is a purely medieval city with a history dating back 1,000 years. If you look at these houses, they are all very old. This is the town hall of the people, which was built a bit later. 
In an old town, the people of power lived in the largest house, the palace of the Prince Bishop here in Greedy. There are many more sights and sounds to explore in Greeting, the town of 21 towers. Among them, the Roman Basilica of St. Martin, as well as St. Jacob's Church. But find out for yourself next time you only plan to put petrol in at Greeting Service Centre. And back with our professional men's leader, Andreas Dreitz, in a great position right now at the front of a group of about seven. We've been given updates on, of course, that it is starting to warm up. We can feel it here in, in our, out, our beautiful outdoor studio. We've got the sun on our backs. You've taken your, ja your jacket off. Uh, the little soft Aussie here's still got her jacket on, but it won't be long before I take mine off. But we're getting reports that, you know, arm warmers are coming off, gloves are coming off. We know in the women's race, Annie Haug is the only one with arm warmers still on. Uh, most of the other athletes now have taken arm warmers and gloves off we did say it, it was it was cold to start there's no doubt it was about 10 degrees celsius to start as we look a great shot of andreas dreitz let's go to a little preview we did on triathlon secrets with andreas dreitz Two years ago here in Roth, when I came first. In the swim, there is no fear in swimming. Well, one, one time I almost forgot my bike. Well, I turned around and, and got it. Uh, yeah, keep focused and remind yourself of the good things. A great little crip of Andy Dreitz. He's a very likeable character, Andy. He is, and he's a, he's a likeable athlete too. Um, you know, we were talking about his tactics before, and it looks like he's actually just going to sit at the front, and he's going to ride solid, or just ride his numbers, and I think over the course of the next, like I say, 30, 40k, um, we're really going to see who can, can hold on there. No, that's right. And we have been given reports that both Thomas Davis and Nick Castelline are now quite a ways behind. So there was that league group of nine. It's now down to a league group of seven because both Davis and Castelline are no longer in that group. We know that Kinlay is now at 6.30 behind our leaders. So that's that's gone out just, you know, it's gone out a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure if he's getting updates out there on course, but he won't be happy to hear that. But, you know, Andy Dreitz, hats off to him. He's really having a great race so far. Yeah, he'll be mindful of someone like Sebi. Keenler coming up as well so he's uh, you could say they're quite quite evenly uh, matched on the bike so um, I would expect that time gap to stay pretty similar between Andy and, and Sebi um, it's just those guys in between and, and whether they can hold on to, to Andy for uh, much longer and in our women's race we know that we've got a great shot there of Annie Haug she is leading this race I have to be honest I know Annie's a great bike rider but I did not expect her to lead the race this early on we know that Fenella language, that gap is starting to open up just that a little bit more. So Fenella still riding in second place. Yeah, I think it's easily easy to think of Annie as a, as a runner because, you know, very pretty, true. pretty much the best runner in the sport. Um, but she can also ride a bike very well and she's shown it now. She's riding away, away from Fenella, who's also a great athlete all around and, and great cyclist. So. Um, Annie must be absolutely loving this being in front of the race. Yep, yeah, exactly. First time here and already off to a great start. We do know that it is starting to heat up. So we started at about 10 degrees Celsius today. It is now at about 13 degrees. So I'm telling you, that's still pretty cold for me, Dylan, I'll be honest. I think it's actually 16 degrees, Blinder. I did okay. just good, check. Good. Um, but the sun is starting to pack some heat. Uh, I, we've heard on course that Patrick was maybe taking off a vest or something he had on. Um, Annie Hark still got her arm warmers on, but uh, you know she could race all day in them. People do, you do have sort of aerodynamic arm warmers, so she that could be part of uh, what she's wearing today. And of course, our men. We spoke before; they have made it up. The infamous greeting we were talking off air, Dylan and I. That was probably the worst part of the course for us both. It's a very, very steep hill, and it's steep very early on. But I think the cruelest part of greeting is even when you think you've got to the top. 
you've got that false flat for such a long period of time and then you've got that really exposed open area where it's often very very windy yeah it's almost like a tour de france climb in the end it, you know you, you have the the steep bit at the at the start so you think oh great i'm i've finished the climb I'm done then you get the rest of the sort of the climb then it turns into a bit of a false flat and then you get the headwind it just seems to be endless so it's one of those moments again that you want to be having a good moment and you'll get through it if you're having a bad one it, it seems endless and the worst part is if you normally you know you know you've got to do it all again on round two uh, but i hope you're really enjoying the coverage so far today remember if you've got anything to say any questions to ask please feel free to write them in and we will answer them for you we're going to go to uh on facebook uh we are going to go to a short break now and we will be back with you shortly <laughs> Successful companies produce a lot, like this, like this, or something like this. In any case, they produce that. Numbers, a lot of numbers. Because with success comes a growing commercial effort. What entrepreneurs need is good software from Dartef. Because we create connections, fast, secure, future-oriented connections between the data in the enterprise, the tax consultant, and every party involved. As one of the largest IT service providers in Europe, Dartef creates connections for sustainable success. Wie wird unsere Welt von morgen aussehen? Vor dem Klimawandel können wir nicht davon laufen. Wir müssen ihn aufhalten. There is no planet B. Invest in solar energy. Welcome back. We are now, we're now at about the two hour, just under the two hour mark into the race. Dylan, let's talk a little bit about nutrition. How important is nutrition? Obviously we know it's a crucial part of, of full distance racing, but would athletes start to be really thinking about it now, two hours in? Well, I hope they would have started thinking about it probably last week or you know <laughs> yeah, a few true. days earlier but <laughs> the, the human body is an amazing thing, but it's even more amazing when it's fueled well. and. And any athlete that has experienced a bad day of fueling versus a good day will tell you that it is night and day. Um, so good fueling is, is absolutely crucial to a good, good full distance race. It certainly is. And of course, Power Bar is one of our official nutrition sponsors out on course. As we get a great shot of our lead female, Annie Haug, out on course there. We know that Annie's obviously doing everything right when it comes to nutrition right now. go to a short clip that we've done for you on nutrition out on the bike course today. I think to be an elite long distance athlete, you have to be an expert in nutrition for sure. It's, uh, it's such a big part of the race and if you aren't fueling properly and you're not getting enough calories in and the right types of calories at the right time, it can completely ruin your day. Obviously the key uh, going into a long distance race is that your uh, carbohydrate stores are completely full. At some races you need every 5k something to eat, at some races you need every 10k something to eat, so I, I will see, uh, it depends on the weather, there are so many influences, you know, and you just have to listen to your body and what your body needs, and if it screams energy, then you have to go for it. <laughs> Yeah, pretty simple for me. I have a good breakfast uh, three hours before the race. I tend to take on um, some carbs just before the swim. Um, I'll have carbohydrates as soon as I get out of the swim. Uh, and then I have a, a gel, carbohydrate gel, uh, every 15 minutes throughout the bike ride. I eat about 400 calories an hour, 350 to 400 calories an hour. That's a combination of 
um, some type of gel or block, um, which is just pure sugar. And then I actually make these rice bars that are um, rice and sugar and maple syrup and cream cheese. Of course, on the bike, it's very important because um, on the run, it's quite difficult actually to digest a lot of carbohydrates. So therefore, you have to uh, use the bike. Nutrition is often seen as, I don't know if it's black magic or not, like to be an expert over the long distance, it, it can work some days and it doesn't work other days. I think that was a really key point that Sebi just made then, that nutrition, the fueling on the bike is key to a successful race. Yeah, it's the, definitely the easiest part of the race to, uh, to fuel, obviously pretty hard on the swim. Um, I've never seen it done, but it would be interesting to see if, if, if someone did. But yeah, the bike is absolutely key to getting all, those, um, all, the, all your carbohydrates and energy in. Uh, usually, you know, the key is that you sort of oversupply in the right so that you've got a good stock there in the run, because the run can be really hard. Um, and the run's often when your stomach's a little bit more upset. Uh, and yeah, so bike at the moment, these guys need to be really nailing their nutrition and being, being two hours in, if they've fallen behind on nutrition by this stage, really hard to come back from to that. come back from it. And how many times, Dylan, do you hear people say, oh, you know, swim and bike were great, but I blew up in the run, and they blame the run for that, but it's often what they did incorrectly on the bike that sets them up for failure on the run. Yeah, absolutely, and, and like I sort of said earlier, you can actually blow up on the bike, but as long as you, and that's more like a strength thing, um, it doesn't mean you're going to have a bad run, but you'll absolutely have a bad run if you haven't fueled properly on, on the bike, so um, I know for me personally it was always a challenge to try and figure out how much I could take on on the bike without feeling rubbish and having that bloated feeling. Um, I think being bloated is kind of inevitable in a, in a full distance race, uh, but yeah, it's so important just to get everything you can in. Absolutely. As we go back to our race, our lead male out on course right now. Obviously doing everything right so far today. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see these new super bikes as well. They are just, These triathlon bikes are designed to hold almost everything you need. And, you know, that's a big sort of one and a half litre um, bladder at the back of this bike there. Uh, he's got a little storage container on his, um, on his frame um, and then pockets in the suit so he's he's basically will be carrying everything or they will be carrying everything they need to get through the race now looking at, at the on screen now we've got obviously Sebastian Kinley six minutes 34 down on our lead group of seven now that is not a position he wants to be in we know that he is losing time to that lead group I think they said there was he was there was about four minutes down out of the swim it's now blown out to six and a half minutes I mean, he still looks terrific on the bike when you look at the footage there, but what's going through his mind now, Dylan? I mean, obviously he knows that he's probably losing a bit of time. How hard is it to stay focused and to stay positive on the job ahead? Yeah, I guess a key point is, does he know or not? Um, if he knows, it would be hard for him to kind of accept that maybe, uh, knowing, you know, who he is and his, his sort of background as a, someone who always kind of rides through the field. Uh, but. You know, I, he's still so experienced. He's such a he's strong-minded athlete. I feel like he will bide his time. It's still early. We're only, a, you know, an hour and ten minutes into what's going to be about a four-hour bike ride. So there's a lot of time for him to make up some ground. And I fully expect to see him um, pull some of the athletes in as we go on. And like we said, he really has developed as, as an all-round triathlete. When he first started in the sport, I still remember uh, many, many years ago when I first came to Germany, I met Sebi for the first time. And he was a terrible swimmer, always been an incredible bike rider. And he was, he was a reasonable runner. But oh, to see how he has transformed himself over the years to being such an all-round athlete, and in particular, such a great runner. Yeah, I remember the... Um I used to race in the German Bundesliga and, and uh, back for Darmstadt and uh, the amount of times I saw Sebastian ride past me was quite demoralising. Uh, he always been a sensational bike rider, um, obviously struggled in the swim but he, he's improved that to the point where he can be competitive now. But when you think back over the last few years and, and Sebi's run, um, far out he's come a long way. I, I specifically think to, um, to the 70.3 world champs in 2019 where I think he was one of the fastest runners. and. I think he went, ran like a 107 or something, something crazy. So he's, his run's come a long way, and that's why we should not count him out, even if he is sort of five minutes off, off the lead, off the bike. Of course, they're on one of the faster sections of the bike right now, a professional men. Really flat and fast section. 
See Peter Heimrich having a good race there, still in that lead group. Patrick Lange in front. Yeah, it looks, it could be Nils from Holden in front of, um, I know, too many Erdinger yes. team members here. There are a lot of Erdinger team Erdinger members up. racing today. I think there's four, four or five, actually five in total. So, incredible team, team Erdinger. But you're right, Nils from Holden, Patrick Lange, all in the same or very, very similar kits. So that's Nils there. Yep. Nils, of course, quite a bit taller than Patrick Lange. Interesting that we haven't panned back to see any other athletes. So could be that um, Braden Curry might be off the back a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure where Patrick is. But I, you know, on paper, I'd say that maybe Nils, um, definitely Peter Heimerich, uh, probably slightly stronger cyclists than, say, Patrick and Braden. Um, so, it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where they all are sitting comparative to each other. Of course, as we mentioned earlier, it's the 12-metre drafting rule out there today. We employed the 20-metre rule last week at the Collins Cup and the championship, so Challenge Family Championship event. And even though it's only 12 metres at this event, there is the, uh, I was going to say, added bonus of the 1K run. I'm not sure the athletes think it's much of a bonus, but it would definitely be enough to stop anyone uh, pushing that 12 metre boundary. Yeah, I think to be safe, a lot of athletes are going to be sitting quite a bit further. further I agree, I agree. But Peter's looking amazing here. Of course, we mentioned earlier, he had a bit of a rough start to the year with quite a few DNFs. I got a, several emails for, from him. He was really down in the dumps. And, and it's, it's really difficult, isn't it? When you, when you start the season and you, and you have a few DNFs, once you get into that rut, it's very, very difficult to pull yourself out. Uh, I know a couple of times back when I was racing, you know, if you started the season poorly, sometimes it was very, very difficult to turn it around. It's almost like you have to walk away, reset and come back again. And, you know, Peter's been able to do that. We know he's had a great race recently in Frankfurt where he finished fourth. And I think he's, he's got a really good frame of mind right now. Back to Annie Haag, who's at the front of the race at two hours in. I think she is going to be super stoked to be where, where she is and just looking in complete control. Nothing to worry about for her at the moment. And from all reports, she she's, has been pulling away from Fenella, who was still in second place. basically daylight between her and, and, and the chasers at the moment. Great shot of Annie out on course. We know Fenella Language is still holding second place. She is losing a little bit of time to Annie. Nothing, nothing significant, but she is losing time to Annie Haug out in front. We know that Fenella's partner, Billy Harris, is out there on course. And we are hoping that we can uh, Zoom call him in and see, just get, a, get an update on what he feels is, is going on out there. And obviously we know he's out on course. He can get a feel of how the women are going. So let's see if we can get Billy online and see what he has to say. We've been just given an update that we will be speaking to Billy Harris at about quarter past nine. So in about nine minutes time, we will go onto the bike course and, and get an update from Billy on the women's race. As we go back to our men's race and our men's leader, and he has been now for quite some time. Yep, Ruben's looking, looking great. You can see he's pushing a little bit of a bigger here, gear here, so it might be a bit of a false flat. Um, I have a feeling like those three, Andy, Nils and uh, Peter, were sort of chasing him down a little bit. You know, at 12 metres, it's, you're not drafting, but there's still a bit of an advantage to stay in the group. So uh, the more in that lead group, um, you know, the better for them all. And if those four were to get away, that could really uh, mix up this race a little bit and give the likes of Braden and uh, 
and Patrick a real uh, run on their hands. And our main spotter out there for our professional men, he keeps writing in telling me how surprised he is that that, Cur that Braden Curry is able to still be there. He said the look, the looks he's giving on his face suggest otherwise, but obviously these people just don't know Braden Curry and don't know how he races. I mean, you've raced Braden Curry many, many times. Having that strained look on the face is nothing new. No, it's, it's a very annoying face because you think, <laughs> oh, I've got him, I've got, I've got him. him. He's but done. You, you never do. Yeah. And Braden loves nothing more than a good battle. Um, He's honestly one of the tough, toughest athletes out there. And uh, you know, I said it before the Collins Cup, he had a very unideal build-up. But if anyone was going to race well off that, it's him. And he's had a great week uh, recovering after the Collins Cup. And I think today he'll, um, he'll just be great to be out, uh, be so happy to be out there. And, and yeah, giving us his facials that will make his athletes think they've got him. He's but done. <laughs> that he's done for the case. day. When, he, when we know he isn't. And really... One of the things that fascinates me most about Braden Curry is he just doesn't seem to have an off button. Another athlete that is obviously similar is Lionel Sanders. They just seem to be able to push that just that little bit further than what the normal amazing athlete is able to push and, and redline it just that little bit more than normal. Yeah, sometimes I get frustrated look, watching Braden race and I think just try and be a little bit more calculated. But Back that's just, just, a bit. Yep. just not him. Um, and look he doesn't need to he races the best when he's just going for it and uh it's a pretty it's a great thing to witness i don't I, i'm glad i'm not him and having to put myself through that much suffering but he loves it and uh we we love to watch it so great for us and of course a big shout out to sally curry his gorgeous wife and kids um tan and bella i'm sure they are at home and i am sure that they are up watching this right now eight hour no nine hour nine hour time different ten hours ten hour time difference there of course new zealand is ten hours ahead uh, but I know that they will be up watching. They stayed up all night last week uh, watching the Collins Cup. I think it started at 2 in the morning for them or 1 in the morning. It was crazy time, but they stayed up all night watching. Yeah, big big fans of the sport and obviously massive fans of their dad and their husband. Um, good little story we can tell maybe later on the husband-wife thing and uh, Braden and I trying to... Uh, trying to get Braden home to New Zealand earlier than he's currently planned, but we can save that story for later. And, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because, obviously, for people that don't live in Australia and New Zealand, it is, it is particularly difficult right now to even leave the country, let alone get back into the country again. And, and Braden Curry just being here has sacrificed so much. Um, and I think that's actually going to be added motivation. When it comes down to the nitty-gritty later today, when it could be Patrick Langer and Braden Curry running head-to-head -head on the marathon, I think that's going to add just that little bit more motivation because the sacrifices that he's gone through and continues to go through, we know he can't get home now. Uh, he can't get a slot back into quarantine till you know, the end of October. That's a long time to be away from your family. Yeah, absolutely. I said to him yesterday, just go win tomorrow or today and then it'll make it all worth it. And he kind of just smiled and nodded and had that little grin on his face like, you know, that's, that's what my plan is and that's what he's absolutely capable, capable of doing. So um, it'll, be, it'll be great to see how he, how he goes. And by all accounts, he's, he's gritting away. He's riding super impressively. He's impressing the spotters out there. Um, so, yeah, hopefully he's within, uh, within touch off the bike. And I'm assuming he's, he's thinking right now, you know, he's in the lead group, he's in the box seat. He's not, we won't see him come to the front now. I don't think he's going to do that. He just knows I just need to stay here or just limit that gap if it does start to open up in the second lap on the bike. But he knows, looking around, that on paper, uh, he is one of the best, if not the best, runner on the field, uh, apart from the likes of, say, Patrick Langer. So it must be, mentally, must be a good position for him to be in right now. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to remember this run course isn't just sealed the whole way. Um, he runs on off he runs off road basically all day every day. Uh, if anyone's going to enjoy the cobbles, it's probably him. Um, he's that, this that kind of person. He loves the that. We no, just he really does love that. And you, I mean, I, I think you saw that last week also in the Collins Cup too. He just he was thriving on that run course. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have been given reports down on ground that we do have Vanilla Language's uh, partner, Billy Harris, with us. So it would be great to get an update from Billy on course. Hello. Well, hello. Hello there. How are you? Hey, I'm OK, yeah. I'm at the A station. 
uh, special needs. So I think the men are about to come through now. And what's it like? First of all, what's it like out there condition wise? Is the wind, we've been given some reports the wind is starting to blow or is it still a very calm day? No, it's, it's very calm. Like, there's not much wind out here. So pretty much uh, perfect conditions for racing right now? Yes, pretty much. Um, yeah, there's, there's very little wind. Uh, I think this is the lead man coming through. Do you want to show? Yeah, you can show us. We, we believe it is Ruben Zapunkta. There yeah. goes Ruben flying. And can you tell us yeah. how many are in that lead group now, Billy? Uh, he has about about a 10 second gap to Dwight Heimrich and uh, they're Neil's coming through now. Home. Yeah, Niels and Lang at the back. There's a group oh. of five. So can you give us an update where Braden Curry is? Braden Curry was originally in that group, but has he dropped off the back of that group now? Yeah, he's off the back. He's, uh, he's not to be seen at the moment. So I think he's dropped off. Cool. Hey, um, Billy, any any surprises out of the swim for you, uh, for the woman? Uh, yeah, a little bit. i um, surprised they all stayed together for for uh, that long. Um, I'd, I'd have to speak to Flella afterwards. Maybe she didn't swim great. But, yeah, it's quite surprising to see a group of five coming out like that. Um, it's obviously changed the dynamic of the race. It wasn't quite expected, but it's, it's, it's made a good race now. Yeah, great. And any inside word on how Fenella was feeling um, pre-race? Yeah, feeling great. I, I have a feeling that Annie's really pushing it um, because, I mean, just the girls behind, I think Fenella's matching Kim Morrison's pace and we know how strong Kim is. She's made, she's still pulling time on Crowley and that group. So I have a feeling that Annie's uh, game plan is to pretty much go all out on the bike. I don't know how she's feeling run-wise. Run we all know she's strong, but definitely is putting out some big power to be able to drop Fenella this early, I would say. Um, so, yeah, it would be interesting to see how the bike goes to see if she holds it. Yeah, I agree, Billy. I, I was saying to Dylan earlier, I'm actually really surprised to see how well Annie Haug is riding. Um, it, here's, I know. Uh, here, here's Brandon on his own now. It's about, about 90 seconds to the group. OK, uh, so you yeah. can just see there, Braden Curry about 90 seconds off that lead group of five now. He was originally riding with that lead group. But going back to the women, I know how strong uh, Fenella Language and Kimberly Morrison are, two of the greatest, exceptionally strong bike riders. So I, I have to admit, I was a little surprised to see Annie Haug actually putting some time into these two women. But you, it, maybe it is a different tactic. Uh, maybe it, it is Annie's tactic to push the bike as hard as she can and just hold on for the run. But um, yeah, definitely was a surprise to me too, Billy. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see Annie, Annie pushing it at the front. Um, and obviously she normally relies on her run. So it makes a really good race. Maybe she might slow down on the run now, give the other girls a chance off the bike. <laughs> I like your thinking, I like it. Uh, hey, yeah, Billy, so yeah. I'm I'm not going to ask you for your woman's pick. I think we know that one. Uh, how about the men? Who do you think's looking the best right now? Uh, before the day, I had money on Braden, to be honest. I just think it suits him. I like I like the fact that it's a bit off-roady run. I think that's good for him. But, I mean, if he can keep that gap, maybe. But it, I think it all depends on if, if Lang's running well, then I think it's going to be hard to, um, to, to take it off him. I, I really have a soft spot for Heinrich. I think it'd be great if he could get on the podium. Um, but yeah, I think I think if Lang stays in that front group, I think it's going to be maybe quite tough to to beat him in a foot race. No, I agree with your picks uh, definitely. Uh, just so you know, we're watching a great we're watching great footage of Fenella now out on the bike. Fenella Langridge currently holding second position here in the women's race. Uh, Billy, thank you so much for your insights. They are perfection. Um, hopefully we can get back to you a little bit later today. Uh, but it's always great to get in, uh, insights and updates of people actually down on course. You have a way better feel for it than what we do uh, from our studio. So th thanks very much for your time today. No worries. See you for a drink later. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, he's a real character, Billy. Um, obviously, Fenella's partner and coach, and he does a superb job with Fenella Language. They're just a lovely couple. They're always smiling, always happy. Um, I follow Fenella on Instagram, and she always she's always making me chuckle. Yep, yep. Great, uh, great pairing there.
and obviously it works pretty well. So great to see. And and uh, you know, I know he didn't want, we didn't ask him who his, who his woman's pick was, but I do think Fenella still has a good chance here. You know, you don't know what how Annie's feeling or what her tactics are today and why she is maybe riding hard. Um, so yeah, we I guess we won't know until we get onto the run. All right, we're going to go to our next uh, guest. We've got Felix Walsefer back on line. He is out on the course. Now, for you, those of you that don't know, Felix, of course, is our race director. What I love about Felix, he does it each and every year, is you do not see him all day long. He is out on the course following the race, thanking the volunteers, making sure the athletes are safe. He will be following the professional men's and women's races out there. So, Felix, have we got you on line? Yes, Belinda, I'm oh. here right in front of I Sölden in oh. the beautiful sunshine. Beautiful. No one is coming for the moment, uh, but I just saw the lead group and boy, Ruben Sepunke is making them suffer. You should see their faces um, behind him. Uh, it's not fun anymore. There is no fun imagine. anymore. I can only imagine. And, and you know what I, I said earlier to Dylan? It, I am, it's giving me memories of um, Cam Worth and what he did to the field back when he raced. Absolutely, Belinda. Absolutely. Um, uh, Braden Curry already uh, got out of the group. He could not hold the group. And uh, even Patrick Lange, his face wasn't fun anymore. Like he was biting. He was really biting to stay in that uh, group. Um, Ruben is, is pushing it really, really hard. And Felix, where are we exactly? How far into the bike ride are the men now? Uh, I'm standing in front of Eisölden at the moment. And so that, what kilometre is that uh, approximately? Oh, Belinda, we have to have a look at the card with the uh, new uh, twists uh, of the bike course. I'm not quite course, sure. I don't want to give a, a, a wrong uh, kilometration here. And of course, just to let our audience know, it is a slightly changed bike course this year, 170 kilometres uh, due to road works. So we are expecting to see some really fast bike times on course today. But Ruben Sapunkta leading, leading our men's race and from all accounts from fe what Felix has said, really making our other professional men suffer. And same for CB. CB is leading the uh, uh, second group. He's pushing it very, very hard. Uh, I just saw him on grading on uh, Calvary Hill, which is our steepest hill. Boy, they suffered as well. So he is trying to uh, to close the gap. Is CB looking sort of under control, Felix? Y yes, CB looks uh, really concentrated. Um, he looks like he has everything under control, just like Ruben uh, in the front. Uh, uh, the other faces are a bit different. Andy is also quite relaxed. He's very focused and he has a he seems really, really good. And honestly, Felix, can you remember the last time we had conditions this good here in Roth? Hey, Belinda, I think we should change for September. It's oh. magical. It's insane. I mean, honestly, I was really, I was really skeptical when you when you were forced, obviously, to change the race to September. I was really quite concerned because I know how cold it can be sometimes in July. But honestly, how wrong was I? It is absolutely magnificent. Absolutely so. And boy, what is Annie doing? She's amazing. We are actually very, very surprised. We just had Billy Harris, Fenella Langridge's partner online and uh, on the phone, yeah. and he is actually surprised as well. Now, Fenella's still riding strong in second position, but I did not anticipate Annie Haug leading the race this early on. No, me neither. Me neither. Here is the chase pack. Uh, girls, this is CB coming. Oh, no. It was Frank Leschke on the front. Okay, so we know that Sebi, Sebi Kinlay is Here is Sebi, here is Sebi, this is Sebi. <laughs> I love, see, I mean, honestly, this is why I love Felix Walsefer. He gets this that excited. So cool. He, lo he loves the race as, as much as the, the biggest triathlon fan in the world. And each and Absolutely. every year he puts 100% in. Honestly, your, your enthusiasm is contagious, Felix. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, if you grow up here in this county, uh, you can't uh, do anything but love triathlon. And you really uh, do see it. Beautiful picture of Sebi now. Yeah, beautiful. Look at him. He's pushing it. Yes, Sebi Kinlay, picture perfect on the bike. Beautiful. 
Okay, well, guys, I Felix. will get back on my motorcycle. This is my driver here, and uh, I'll call in later on again. You're fantastic, Felix. Thank you. We appreciate these updates so much. Thanks, Felix. No worries. Bye, guys. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. All right, so amazing. I just, honestly, I, how can you not love the man? He's just incredible. And we were, he was at the top of a Solden, a really popular part, beautiful part of the bike course, as you can see. Let's go to a quick profile on the town of a Solden. One of the many picturesque places lining the bike course is the village of a Solden. Something of a Franconian fairy tale, it is home to a community of 800 people socialising in a variety of local clubs, choirs, youth groups and the like. Life is tranquil here, close to nature and shaped by centuries-old traditions, which become apparent in the middle-aged church of Thomas and St. Egidius, old farm and schoolhouses, as well as Ali Solden's landmark building, a 1,000-year-old castle owned by Veronica Sheila. Not everyone can say, my home is my castle, with the same meaning that I do. Veronica's home is indeed her castle. Inherited from her mother, the Landlady's Inn has become a popular place to meet for the entire community. After spending some time abroad, Veronica has returned to her native region of Franconia, with its traditions very close to her heart. If younger people like me didn't care about these places, they would eventually just disappear. And beautiful Ice Solden, gorgeous day out there today. As we go back to our women's leader, Annie Haug, definitely raising a few eyebrows now. We knew that she was, uh, she definitely is the favourite to take out the overall win today, but I don't think any of us expected to, to take control of this race so early, but great to see Annie Haug having a very, very strong ride out there today. I don't think Annie expected that either. No, I'm sure she didn't. It looks, that looked very close there, but I think Fenella's just made a pass. I hope so, anyway. Yeah, of course, Fenella Langridge holding second position. We know Kimberly Morrison is up there as well. Rach McBride was holding third, but took a little bit of a detour. Thankfully, didn't lose too much time. And Sarah Crowley is uh, apparently riding really well, really strong at the, fr at the front of the chase group. So uh, great to see her up and in the mix. I think that's an age group man behind there. And of course, just to update you, so with our professional men today, you also have the sub nine group go off with those professional men as well as over 65s. So it is quite a large group. And that's why you can see Fenella Langridge was passing one of those sub nine men on the bike. Pretty, pretty cool opportunity for those over 65s to be um starting with the pro wave it really is yep as we can see another one of our top men of course our other age group men were starting about 10 minutes back after our professional women and back to Ruben I wouldn't be surprised you know if Ruben has been here and checked out this course quite a bit because I agree he's also obviously an ex-pro cyclist so he knows how to handle a bike um, but knowing this course he can really drive his advantage home and it, and it looks like he's doing that. No, I, I definitely agree. And you can just see he's not even getting out of his error bars, able to take all of these corners down in his error bars. Whereas a lot of the other riders around through town, some of the tricky technical sections through the towns, are having to, having to get up and out of the error bars. Great position. From Ruben Zapongti just here. We saw the same not too long ago, Cam Wirf, in his last full distance race, where he just was able to make up so much time in the technical sections of the course. Technical skills just so superior to the others. And in the chase group, it sounds like uh, Philip Bulk is, uh, is leading that group now, riding really strong and having, having the race of his life.
course, great shots here of the bike course. Our professional men, our professional men's leader, leading the bike as he has done so since the very beginning of the bike ride. We're going to head to a quick commercial break and be back with you shortly. For everyone who loves adventure. For everyone who makes their dreams a reality. For everyone who aims high. For everyone who maintains a clear view. For everyone who keeps family close to their heart. For everyone who refuses to compromise from head to toe. We protect you anytime, anywhere. Protecting people. Now available online. uvex group.shop. Successful companies produce a lot, like this, like this, or something like this. In any case, they produce that. Numbers, a lot of numbers. Because with success comes a growing commercial effort. What entrepreneurs need is good software. From DATEV, because we create connections. Fast, secure, future-oriented connections between the data in the enterprise, the tax consultant, and every party involved. As one of the largest IT service providers in Europe, DATEV creates connections for sustainable success. Wie wird unsere Welt von morgen aussehen? Vor dem Klimawandel können wir nicht davon laufen. Wir müssen ihn aufhalten. There is no planet B. Invest in solar energy. And welcome back to the DATEF Challenge Roth, powered by HEP. And we are back on the race course with our lead female, Annie Haug, who is having the ride of her life right now. She looks absolutely terrific as she goes through one of the many aid stations out here on the course today. We do know it is starting to heat up, sitting at about 16 to 17 degrees. You can see that Annie has got rid of the arm warmers, so you can tell that the riders are also starting to feel the heat. And Annie taking quite a few bottles there, getting the water in, getting the hydration in. And we've got a, a really special guest coming up now online, and it's Annie Haug's bike fitter, Daniel Shade. It's going to be very, very interesting having a talk to him right now, Dylan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, bike fits have really come into fashion in the last sort of, you know, three, five years. And you can see the, the positions are all kind of sh morphing into that, this, this kind of look here with Ruben. But so it's going to be great to talk to Daniel, and I think we've got Daniel online now. Hello. Are you there, Daniel? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hey, good morning. How are you finding the coverage so far? Uh, absolutely okay. I'm uh, pretty happy to see uh, in the pictures how um, Annie is performing at the moment and I really like the whole race. So it's always a special day when Roth is taking place in Germany. Yeah, great. I guess a, a big question for me is we often go to the to get a bike fit 
um, and we get one and we often think we're done. But how many, I guess, how many appointments does did Annie take to get her position now and get as comfortable and as fast as she is? So the journey Annie and me have done so far is about three years now. And I think we have seen us eight to nine times over that period of time. And for me, uh, creating an arrow position or not creating because uh, Annie came to me with an arrow position, but uh, to fine tune it and to find more potential. It's always a long term journey. It takes time to evolve that and to adapt to some changes and then to make rechanges, analyze the rechanges, see are we on the right track? Do we have to make a change? And it, it doesn't come overnight that you can sit in an arrow position for such a long time. And yeah, nine appointments so far and more to come. Yeah, great. I think the listeners and the, the viewers will really find that quite quite helpful because um, you often think that you go along to one and, like I say, you, you you got the perfect position, but it doesn't doesn't quite work like that. Another question I have, would you prefer to see an athlete sacrifice a little bit of comfort or would you prefer to see them sacrifice a little bit of aerodynamics? In your mind, what is going to be the most important for a full-distance race? So first of all, I love this question because it really nails uh, the important uh, point in bike fit, and it also nails the importance why we as bike fitters uh, help or work with so many athletes. Um, when you look at these two extremes, you have got aerodynamics on one side. You want to be as aerodynamic as possible, get every gain possible, and you have comfort and stability on the other hand. And a lot of lot of people talk about that as these are two opposites, and we can't get both. In my opinion, it's, uh, it's different. So when we get a, a rider in a more comfortable position, in a more stable position, you gain a lot, a lot of aerodynamics over time. So um, aerodynamics in the last hour means you're still stable, you're still comfort, you don't have to move a lot lateral, for example, on the bike, you don't have to go out of the aero position into the base, base bar position. So for me, comfort is definitely the key element. It's a foundation. And when your position is comfortable, when you can sit in that position for basically the whole bike split, then you can think about your aerodynamic gains. But this is for me really the second step. And I would rather prefer to be a little bit less aerodynamic, but make sure that we can create this kind of stability that the rider can't ju just can stay longer in the aero position. Especially for age groupers, this is mainly the task. Stay in the aero position as long as you can. And you, absolutely, and you make so many really, really uh, good points there. Obviously, Annie is a small athlete, uh, so when we look at her on the bike now, she looks really, really compact, really, really aero, but also very, very comfortable. But as far as you know, is there an aero disadvantage for, say, the larger athletes or the larger bike frames? Yeah, for sure. Um, one part of aerodynamics is the frontal area. And uh, when you talk with or, or think about larger athletes, um, you definitely have a, a, a larger frontal area that you have to cope with. But uh, there are some opportunities to go, for example, to really try to make them as narrow as possible. But of course, shoulder width is also something which is a human factor. It's hard for us to reduce the shoulder width that it's given by nature. But um, yeah, normally it's, it's easier to create um, very, very nice aerodynamic numbers, very nice CDA numbers with smaller athletes. And uh, for larger athletes, we've got a little bit more challenge to make them as aero, but also as stable, as quiet as possible. As I, as I said before, this is still one, one really um, uh, important part of that whole process. And that leads on beautifully to my next question which was do you use any online software to measure CDA for athletes or um, yeah I think there are some programs out there that can do it so is that something that you use? Yeah our approach is a little bit different so we, we believe in offline uh, work so we really work physically with with an athlete and what we are doing is we uh, when we start a project like working with any we have basically one complete day that we do in the fit lab and to understand the position biomechanically, to understand how the athlete uh, interacts with all contact points, with the saddle, with the foot pedal interface, with the handlebar, make a list of ideas what we want to test, test something biomechanically. And then the next step is, for example, going into the velodrome and testing the rider really under real conditions, pushing their wattage and see how a CDA change uh, might happen when we do for example, shorter crank or go lower with the cockpit or go longer or whatever. So it's always biomechanical first and then velodrome testing for really get these CDA numbers. 
I don't believe so much in just calculating numbers in an, in an online program, for example, because I want to see compensation movements too. So an example, I have a lower CDA number, but I want to see that this is a lack of saddle stability now. And then I have to balance and see, oh, do I want to have this uh, lack of saddle stability? Is it okay for me? Or is it so drastic that I say, no, no, we don't go this aerodynamic way because we lose so much stability. I, I don't want to go that direction. And we just got a, an absolutely magnificent shot online of our lead, our lead male, Ruben Sapuncta. And obviously being an ex-cyclist, he has a beautiful position on the bike. But, but even more than that, he's, he's technique is cornering i mean we just saw him go around age group athletes and his cornering was impeccable uh, obviously this is going to be a huge advantage for for such a a great cyclist here on course today yeah so i think ruben is a very nice example when you look when you look at his position he doesn't look super aggressive he doesn't look super arrow on the bike but he's super stable and i think that's the way his team wanted to go to make him as comfortable and also as stable as possible without going as low as as possible and uh, now i see in, in in my stream i see any again and when you look at her cockpit for example it would be possible to bring her head down and also to bring her shoulders a little bit more uh, a little bit lower but we have tested that and we have seen there is a big risk that we take some of her running strengths when we go lower for the bike split and at the end I'm, as a bike fitter, I'm responsible for the bike split, by, but I have to look at the overall performance of an athlete. And I don't want to win 1% in the bike split and lose 2% for the running split. So I think it's also that balance. What's the strength of the athlete? And when you have a, a running strength, keep that and try to build the position that you really uh, keep the advantages and the benefits of your, of your athletes. Oh, honestly, such incredibly wise words. Thank you so much for coming on. I think I've just... <laughs> I think I've learned just, just as uh, more than I thought I would as well. It's just it's it's wonderful to get your words of wisdom, and and just lastly, lastly, I'll be honest. I did not expect to see Annie Haug having control of this race this early, but I'm sure you probably did. Uh, I of course we know she's a phenomenal runner. I just did not think that she had would have the lead she has so early on in the bike ride. Um, but is this something that you definitely expected? Yeah, so um, there was a plan to be quite aggressive today, but uh, nonetheless, it shows me at the moment that she's really feeling good and she has some good legs. And it was also uh, seeing her in the front group really coming out of the swim and now on the bike. Uh, yeah, I think it's her home soil and uh, she's just burning for that uh, for that race today. And uh, I hope it, it will stay in that plan and uh, I will try to scream from here uh, there are some kilometers uh, but uh, i try to to uh, to see her win today yeah and it would be incredible of course last uh, two years ago we saw andreas dreitz uh, being the, the first franconian to win uh, here in roth and of course if any were to win again today or were to win today sorry she would be the the first female franconian to win here in roth so it really would be quite special yep <coughs> So as you said, this is uh, it's it's always a special day in Germany for the whole triathlon scene when Roth is taking place, and we have so many incredible athletes today racing that race. And uh, your coverage is nice for me as an analyst as well to look at some details of the position, make some notes, prepare for my next sessions with some of the athletes. And uh, yeah, so keep on that show, and uh, I will follow you all the day. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh it's been some amazing insight. Really good for the viewers, I think, to hear hear your wise words. And uh, thank you again, and um, good luck with Annie out there. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Wow, that was incredible. What what a what a wise, intelligent man he is. Yeah, I think we bike fits have always been important, and we've always told athletes, we've always known as athletes that you should get them. They're important, um, but I think he just really drove home how important they are there and it's not just about the bike you see a lot of age groupers out there that have got such an aggressive position that they can't even actually hold it and so they end up riding on their drops all day it's slower they're probably actually quite uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, so it has a detrimental effect to their run as well so exactly perfect uh, perfect example there of setting Annie up to be a really fast and efficient cyclist but also be able to get off and run and run and as we know running is her strength and to be able to run to her ability so yeah really really great stuff so thanks again daniel awesome
course, we are now two hours, 42 minutes into our men's race and two hours, 39 minutes into our women's race. Uh, there was some fabulous footage earlier on when we were on call to Daniel of Ruben Sapongte taking those corners like an absolute pro. Yeah, my, my heart was in my mouth a little bit there. <laughs> Me Watching too. him go around the, um, the grates in the road and the oh. little the manholes. Um, the last thing you want to do is when you're on the absolute edge of, a, of your tyre and you hit a little bump or something. But he, he made it look like a pro, like he, he is. Um, and yeah, interesting to hear Daniel's feedback. I think we could look and see his position and think he's not that aggressive, but he's comfortable. Yep. He can deliver the most power in that position and it's clearly showing with him, uh, with him riding off the front. Absolutely, and, and, and like we said before, I've, I've barely seen him out of his error bars. Even round through uh, the tight corners in towns, he's able to stay down in that error position, so there's very, very little movement, and he's able to do that because he doesn't have such an aggressive error position. Yeah, absolutely, and you can see Annie here as well. She's uh, She looks comfortable. She looks like she wants to be on those error bars, and you know she can almost fall asleep there, so that's a, that's a great sign. And honestly, look at those splits back now to our second and third females. We've got 2.57 back to Fenella Langridge, and then 6.48 to Kimberly Morrison. And we know that both Fenella and Kimberly are superb bike riders. So to think that Annie Haug is putting time into these ladies just shows you how well she really is riding today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how far behind Kimberly was out of the swim, but. I, th I think she's sort of uh, she's done a lot of time trial, outright time trials in the UK, and she's a phenomenal cyclist. So, uh, you know, it's still relatively early in the bike, um, it's sort of one third of the way through. So you don't know what's going to happen. But Annie is an endurance machine. She's uh, she's not going to really slow down too much. So I think uh, she's setting up for, you know, maybe on a on a day when the when the course wasn't short, could have been a really good crack at um, at at a fast time. We have just been given an update out on course. Luke McKenzie, of course, is over here from the US supporting Braden Curry, one of his athletes. They sponsor him with Win Republic. And I know that Luke is very keen to make sure Braden has a great race out there today. We do know that he was dropped off the back of that lead group. And he's now currently sitting at about one minute down from that group? So we've had a report that Sebastian did take, Sebastian Keenan did take a wrong turn on the course. So maybe that can explain why he lost a little bit more time than we would have expected. Not not great for Sebi, but you know, he loves a challenge and uh, I'm sure it's just going to add a bit more fuel to his fire and, and be interesting to see a, a new time split and see if he's uh, pulling any time back. It's becoming a little bit of a trend. Uh, wrong turns on courses. Of course, it is the athlete's responsibility to know the course. Maybe people were getting a little bit too comfortable in their bike setups and they just forget to watch. Forgetting what they're doing. <laughs> watch where they're going. <laughs> so we know that our leader, Ruben Zapunkta, has just come through Eckes Mullen. So well and truly on to the second lap now. We did have some footage of Thomas Davis before too, or Tom Davis as he likes to be known. Um, he was kind of the opposite. He looked like he had a really aggressive aero position. Um, I know when I've seen sort of shots of him on, on Instagram and stuff, I, there's no way I could have held that position. So um, he looks like he's sort of gone for that aero advantage versus comfort. But for all we know, he could also be very comfortable. And just to... Go back on what you said before about Kimberly Morrison. Apparently, she really is riding incredibly well out there. So you're right, she did have quite a deficit out of the swim. And she is really pushing very, very hard now. So even though that time gap was reasonably long, uh, reasonably big, she is riding very, very well out there. As we great aerial shot of the bike course here today in Roth. You can see our top five men up on screen. Ruben Zapunkta really putting the hurt down on the field. Obviously a 120 gap now back to Andreas Dreitz. And we're going to go to a small commercial break and we will be back with you again shortly. For everyone who loves adventure. For everyone who makes their dreams a reality. For everyone who aims high. 
For everyone who maintains a clear view. For everyone who keeps family close to their heart. For everyone who refuses to compromise from head to toe. We protect you anytime, anywhere. Protecting people. Now available online. uvax-group.shop Successful companies produce a lot, like this, like this, or something like this. In any case, they produce that. Numbers, a lot of numbers. Because with success comes a growing commercial effort. What entrepreneurs need is good software. From Dartev, because we create connections. Fast, secure, future-oriented connections between the data in the enterprise, the tax consultant, and every party involved. As one of the largest IT service providers in Europe, Dartev creates connections for sustainable success. Wie wird unsere Welt von morgen aussehen? Vor dem Klimawandel können wir nicht davon laufen. Wir müssen ihn aufhalten. There is no planet B. Invest in solar energy. And welcome back. What a magnificent day we are having here now. We are being told that the temperatures are rising. We started with a very chilly day here in Roth, but we are now at what I would say is pretty close to perfect race temps. Yeah, it's an amazing day here. Uh, I'm a big fan of the idea of moving it to September if the weather's like this every time. No, I'm with you too. I mean, normally the race is in July. They moved it to September. They took a bit of a risk, but they obviously had no choice in the matter. But it has paid off and it is absolutely beautiful here today as we see a great shot of our race leader, Annie Haug. We're going to go back to some of our WhatsApp messages on screen. So, of course, just a reminder that you can write into us. In the US. Good luck to everybody doing Challenge Roth today. You're going to have a great day. Enjoy the journey. Remember your strength is in your passion. Now go out there and find that finish line. Good luck. Go, Chrissy, go, Chrissy, go, go, go. Oh, I love the WhatsApp updates. Of course, that was Fireman Rob. He is such a character and such an incredible man. Uh, he's done some amazing things uh, for charity. He, I've watched him here. He completes the entire marathon in his fireman suit, which is no mean feat. Just almost speechless. Um, probably the one of the strongest athletes out there on any race course when he's there. Uh, mentally, just dragging that that full fire suit it just blows my mind when you see him out there when you're racing with him it's just unbelievable so great to get a message from him it's back on course with our lead female Annie Haug we knew coming into this race that she was a favorite to take the win we thought that she would definitely not do that until some stage in the marathon but she's proving us all wrong here. Let's just go to a short interview that we did, Triathlon Secrets, with Annie Haug herself. Ken Morris. 
For sure, that was my two Olympic Games and winning um, ITU Hamburg. And as a long course athlete, of course, it was winning Ironman Hawaii. So there are two, two hearts in my chest. <laughs> There are a lot of fears in the swim. I hate it if it's so close and everyone is bunching up each other. So um, the first buoy on short course, it was always my biggest nightmare because it was like war in the water. I try to sing a song and get back to rhythm. You just have to like find um, mental strategies to get rid of the voice which says, oh, it's so painful, it's so painful. Because after the marathon is over, <laughs> that's a good thing. And of course, that beautiful smile of Annie Haug, I'm sure she is, well, we might not be seeing a smile right now. I'm sure she's smiling on the inside because she is in the box seat at the race here today looking absolutely magnificent on the bike so far. I think all the Annie Hag fans out there are definitely smiling and, you know, she's at the front at two hours, 50, 51 minutes into the race. So I feel like if she could smile, she would absolutely be smiling. Yeah, and it really is great to see. We know she hasn't had an easy time of it this year, as we mentioned earlier, getting to challenge at Miami. She was one of the favorites going into that race and unfortunately was unable to race returned a positive COVID result, result, had to spend two weeks in quarantine in a hotel in the US before making her way back home. And then of course there were a couple of complications once she'd got over the initial stages of COVID. She got uh, type two diabetes, but looking like she is well and truly over it now as that was a great shot of Kimberly Morrison. I think the only female out on course right now, riding as fast as Annie Haug or maybe even faster. Yeah, she looks, she looks great. She's one of these athletes that looks comfortable and super aerodynamic, just a, almost a perfect setup. And we know she does have that sort of cycling pedigree, so she's clearly spent a lot of time dialing in that position. Yeah, so great race from Kimberly Morrison so far. You can see the current air temperature out there has already climbed to 18. So while we started at 10 degrees C, we are now already up to 18 degrees and we expect that to continue climbing throughout the day to a high of about 26 degrees C. There's not a cloud in the sky. We have a 360 degree view right here in our outdoor studio. And it really is, there is nothing but blue sky all around us. So we get some great footage of the bike course here today. We do have a very special guest coming up very shortly. I always love talking to this man. He is an absolute legend of the sport worldwide and of course definitely here in Germany. He's always also a bit of a comedian. We were lucky enough Dylan and I to spend most of last week with him. He was an incredible, an incredible Collins Cup captain for Team Europe. It was awesome to see him getting right behind Team Europe, the winning team of the Collins Cup of course, so no wonder he was smiling from ear to ear. But we are going to welcome up into our studio right now Norman Stadler. Stadler. Storm and, Storm and Norman, he just said. Are we still Storm and Norman, though? I got the name from, the, from an Aussie, <laughs> from Craig. That's Welchy. right. That's right, Greg Welch, famous, famous Welchie or Plucky. Plucky, we like giving, Australians like giving nicknames to everyone. That's yeah. just the way we do it. So First Norminator and then Stormy Norman. What one do you like best? Uh, Norman. No, oh, come yeah. on, I like Storm and Storm Norman. Storm and Norman. Storm and Norman's good. Yeah. How are you doing? Have you recovered from last weekend? Oh, I still, I still smell like champagne, but uh, you know, Europe won. <laughs> rub it in, why don't you? Rub it in. Uh, yeah, no, it's an amazing event that we had, and uh, you, you said it, uh, one week together with, you know, I had dinner one evening with, uh, we had 21 Hawaii victories on one table. So It's crazy. It was a, a crazy week, yeah. Awesome. Um, 
I'm going to go straight to Annie Hark. She was a little bit disappointed last week. Do you think she's back with a little bit of vengeance today? Uh, it's a training day for her, I think. She's leading the bike already, so and her strength is all, is coming. <laughs> you know, crazy. The marathon crazy is, is her strength, and uh, so, yeah. You know, some girls or also some some guys they had a bad race last week, so or bad luck. So now, yeah, it's 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 her day. Yeah. Now, Team Europe. Yes. They on paper they were unstoppable. Yeah. Uh, and. In real life, they're unstoppable. What did it? What it mean I, to watch you guys? As you said, you still smell of champagne. To watch you guys up on stage celebrating, there was a real. It was an incredible camaraderie. I mean, at the beginning of the week, we were talking. Team Europe. It seemed to take them a little bit longer to gel, uh, oh. to realise. But by the end, oh my gosh, they were incredible. We all know that you know they are not best friends. Nope. On, also on paper, uh, Jan, Jan, and uh, Patrick, and Sebi, and Patrick. They had some. You know some little fights, uh, which is good for the sport. Yep. We we need that in our sport. But then, yeah, we, it was a really, really like it, it was a team in the end. So and Jan was fighting for every second, and you know he he was leading, he was winning his his mix up, uh, match up, and uh, and also Sebi. Sebi had, uh, you know, he talked before the race. <laughs> If he comes second behind Lionel, he will retire. So, and he came second, and uh, I, you know, he was crying in my in my arms yeah, when he finished. It was an incredible. He said, "Oh, sorry, Norman. I was your captain's pick, and I, I, I disappointed." And uh, so, uh, yeah. In the end, it was a. You, you saw the pictures, and I saw it too, and uh, and, the, and the video after. We we loved it. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, we are an individual sport, triathlon, and uh, I was one of the first guys who. You know, I, I, I founded a team because it's so important to 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 win and lose together. So, yeah. Um, do you think for Sebi it's a little bit of a case of it's been a really hard 18 months. He's been injured. He's been a little bit unsure about things. You guys picked him, which I thought was a great pick. He's been one of the best athletes in the world for a long time. And the, being the person he is, he was just a little bit disappointed that he didn't quite deliver for you. But I think oh, that was... Isn't. That was one of the, he thinks he, yeah, he yeah. didn't deliver, but I think um, that was one of the amazing things to see was that at the end of it, your team was so strong. You Maybe you yeah. started a little bit yeah, we, unsure. Yeah, women's race, you know, Daniela had, had some difficulties in, in her race. She got an, uh, like an allergy overnight and wholly crashed. And yeah. so we, we came, I think, was second, I think, after the women or in the, in the, in the ranking. Yeah. So, and it, uh, yeah, the man's, they, they fix it in the end. And of course, Sebi, Sebi is a winner. Sebi is uh, off the front. And in heat, he told me after he pushed the hardest he ever pushed for the f one, one and a half hours, yeah. and he couldn't catch Lionel. And you know, yeah. he did, a, he did a three Ironman distances in eight weeks. So <laughs> I don't know how, but yeah. So Sebi was disappointed, of but course. But how do you think, looking at the race now, Yeah. obviously last week, Patrick Lange, uh, and and Sebi were on a team together, working together. Now they're back to normal triathlon, where they are competing against yeah. each other. Patrick Lange is in a good position in the chase group. Sebi's further down, probably a little further down than he would yeah. have anticipated. Oh, I heard ten minutes already. Oh, it's, it's a big gap. It was between six and a half to maybe eight minutes. It might have it might have pulled out to, to ten minutes. He may have taken a wrong turn. We heard. So. We heard. Yeah. Really? Lost, lost a couple extra minutes. No. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. So I, I, I saw him in transition, and he, he couldn't get his, his uh, suit on, his bike suit, uh, so his racing suit. So uh, he looked not that motivated. You know, he already had four and a half minutes yeah. mm. to, to Patrick. No, Patrick improved his cycling. Mm. He is not only a runner now. He's a, he can swim with the lead, you saw, yeah. and he can ride with the, with the group, or he can hold the pace. Not with maybe Seenpunkte, who is leading, a former cyclist, but uh, my pick is, is Patrick today. So he's, yeah, he's hungry, he trained a lot, not many races. He's, he's adding a sponsor, you know, it's his home race here. And yeah, yeah, I think it will Patrick say. And I think for Patrick, his biggest worry might have been Braden, right? From last weekend, Braden got the better of him. Um, but looking at this, Patrick's. I've got oh, rid know, of Brayden, and it's now an it's, distance. it's not a. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it's not, not a 
a 1.8 swim or 2k swim and uh, you know 100 kilometers in total so it's a, it's an Ironman distance but he's got some company there people that can can run you know Peter Heimerich Nils Fromhold these are guys yeah. that do know how to run so yeah but he's, he knows better he, he's in the box seat <laughs> he knows better he can he can run so fast Patrick and if he's in the lead already he's a uh, it's going to motivate him it's, even more, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. motivate him. So we did just get given an update out on course that Norman, uh, Norman Stadler. That uh, course, yeah, yeah, I wish course. you were on the course. Yeah, no. uh, it was great when you were uh, racing. You I've watched that. you many times <laughs> racing on course. Uh, we have been given an update that Sebi Kinlay is now over 12 minutes back, uh, yeah, so he so. is continuing to lose yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that's not, racing, not, huh? Yeah, that's racing. Not his day, and you know, it, the dynamic in front is is very very strong. Strong. So yeah, but 12 minutes already. I think he won't finish this race. Yeah, uh, super disappointing to, to hear that, and but also agree. You know, if you're not having a good day, there's no yeah. point in um, just digging a, a bit of a hole. You know, and there's and no need for those guys to finish. You know, yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. this discussion. Yeah, you have to finish a race. You know, it's you know, it's their job, and maybe he's doing another race in a, in exactly. a few weeks. So, if he drops out, it's fine. And I know, but already the you know the the. The internet and the online blah 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 mm -hmm. starts and you have to finish a race and blah. So yeah, I hit it many times. Now that's a, it's a really interesting point you bring you bring up because obviously a lot of our age group athletes out there that are doing it for fun for a hobby, doing yes. it seriously. Yes. Um, sometimes they they give the pro athletes a little bit of a hard time yeah. when they don't finish, but they don't understand that this is their profession. This is how they make a living. And in a year or last 18 months where it's been incredibly difficult to even find a race line mm. to get to it's even more important that they make every single race count yeah, so yeah. if it's not their day yeah. and they're not feeling it then they do it is another one exactly they need to yes. they need to stop yeah. find the next one yeah. but um yeah I, I i know it's sometimes a little bit different when it comes to world championship events the likes of kona yes. then often the pro you athletes will there, yeah, exactly. you know it's yeah. the last race of the year but still there you know if you walk in hawaii oh, that's a long day it's a hot <laughs> i did it <laughs> a i've few done times. it i've done it i think we've all and, done it uh, yeah. it's not pretty yeah no it's not pretty <laughs> yeah the only the only good thing you really get is a suntan but you actually get a bit more sunburn <laughs> too, so. much. Yeah, too I, much yeah i walked my last i in hawaii so together with tim the boom and we crossed the finish line together 2010 and we we, we promised we will never ever come back <laughs> and we did so we came ne yeah. we never came back <laughs> yes, i'm sure uh, you're not the only one to ever say that yeah. and there'll be plenty plenty to follow that's yeah. for sure but uh conditions i mean could you have asked perfect. for better no it's perfect uh, so uh, not so many spectators i think today but for the athletes it's it's, it's perfect yeah. it's still a bit cold in the morning so anna was wearing uh, long sleeves and uh, i saw patrick is riding with shoe covers mm -hmm. So, yeah, but now it's, it's perfect. Blue Beautiful. sky. Uh, how was the wind on the course? Very little. So it, it definitely it, it was n none at all to start with. There's a little bit of wind out there, but we've been told it's not affecting the bike course at all. So they are on record speed or record? Uh, well, this is where it gets a little tough, Norman, because of the extensive 170k. Uh, so yeah. it, we, we'll need our we'll need our analyst Torsten Radder to yeah, actually he, give us an update. He's sitting there. He's sitting there. Yeah. Good man. <laughs> Hello, big shout out to Torsten, <laughs> our stats man. He'll be able to tell us whether they are actually on course record yeah. uh, with the revised course. But it would not surprise me. I mean, you look at that lead group and you look at the likes of Ruben Zapunta, yeah, who we know yeah, is yeah, phenomenal yeah, on the bike. Yeah. Yeah. Can you run? He's improved his running. I've been looking at some of his results. This is his first time over this distance. So there's so much of an unknown about him. We know that he's definitely improving. It's a work yeah. in progress over the half distance, but none of us really know how he's going to run over 42K. But I think last weekend at the Ironman in Hamburg, also a former cyclist won. His first ever Ironman and he won in 8 to 12. But it was incredible time. Yeah, and he I also think he, could run. Yeah, he was. He was a, an ex-cyclist but also a rower, I believe, yes. but he was unbelievable. So it was not worth uh, Cam no, was no, it? Was it Cam? No, it wasn't Cam. No, no, no. Well, Cam did win. <laughs> Cam did win. No, sorry, Cam, that one. I'm talking about at Hamburg, there was an I, age group man that actually, but was he an ex-cyclist or an ex-rower? The one in Hamburg. I don't know. But he raced as an age group athlete because obviously Hamburg was pro only yes. for the women. But his time was yes. oh, yeah. incredible. Yeah. There, there was an ex-rower, so it could have been him in Hamburg. But for Ruben, leading off the bike, you know, maybe he can run, maybe he can't run that well. But when you're leading, you grow you wings. You grow, grow wings. wings. Drive you on. So, be interesting to see how how much time he gets. And what's your afternoon looking like? I was just about to ask the same question. What's the plan from here on in? 
VI yeah, VIP tip. We are going for breakfast now. <laughs> you know, I was already at breakfast and then I got a call. After you got to come here. Can you so come and see us? Can you bring no, us a coffee, please? Yeah. Huh? Can you bring us a coffee, a please? Real coffee? Yeah, real coffee. I'll yeah. have a, a flat white. No, no. Latte no, no. for my, no, my main expensive. man here. I'm not a delivery man. Come on. <laughs> 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 no, oh, no. Norman, it no, is I, always... I enjoy the course today. I yeah. enjoy. I'm here with friends and uh, just to to watch the race. And I was here for CB too. Yeah. So, but yeah, poor guy. Uh, but that's, you know, he was injured. Mm -hmm. He's a new daddy. Mm -hmm. baby, There's a lot going on uh, right Baby now. at home. It's so much. You know, it's. Yeah, life life changed. Of course. For me, after having you know kids. And uh, then you have a bad year and a COVID and uh, all those responsibilities. You have sponsors. You have to yeah, you have to deliver. And uh, on the races you have, you know, not, not many races. And uh, yeah, but you know, CB, I, lo I love him. And I, we were just saying before. That's why I picked admitted, him for the. He's already admitted we, he's got a boy, a boy, a man crush on him. So don't worry about that. But I think I've said it time and time again. A race is always better when Sebastian Kinlay is in it. Yeah, he's talking big before the race. He's not like, oh, maybe I win. Or, you know, he's he's a face of 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 of, of triathlon. Yep. And uh, yeah, he's a he's a nice guy and. Uh, I raced him years ago in my in, uh, in the Olympic distance was a series in Germany and after that race I asked him to join Dresdner Kleinwald Investment Bank team. Yep. You know we offered him good good money. I said no no I don't like that. I I want to get fast first of the shorter distances and then I maybe I do the Ironman distance and uh, and he said no to me. Oh, <laughs> how could anyone say no to you? No. What don't were they know. thinking? <laughs> <laughs> no no. Uh, I would say though he did run well last weekend. He might, maybe he's not having the best day on the bike, but you never know. He could get off and decide he's going to try yeah, and run a good you know, marathon. We, we don't about, we talk about uh, amateur race in front. You know, those guys are <laughs> really fast. Yep. And 12 minutes, you know, already lead by, uh, you know, also Neil Stromhold is there. Mm -hmm. Peter. Peter Heimrich. Yeah, and, and Andy, Andreas, Andreas and, 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 and uh, who's the other guy who can run? Patrick. So yeah, it's 12 minutes. It's it's too much. You can call it a day. So I don't I don't know if he if he will finish the race. Uh, Let's see. I'm you not I'm not counting him out just yet. No, no. You know what's what's next? Is there another race somewhere? I think there are several the other world? races going yeah. yep, going ahead. So it, it'll be interesting. He will have others to choose from, but. Uh, there's, yeah, a couple couple of later season Ironmans. I know uh, Ironman California is yes. shaping up to be a good race. Maybe he... I think there's another guy, another big German is racing there, I think. Yes. He goes okay. He's, he's, a, he's, he's a, the goat. <laughs> the goat. The goat. Oh, that's right. And, of course, it still holds the record here. Um, incredible, incredibly fast times. But, yeah, beautiful day. Norman, we will not interrupt you from your breakfast any no, no, longer. No, you know, any time. Thank you very much for joining us. Not because of him, us. but because of you. Of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, always, always, know, always knows what to say, Norman Stubb. <laughs> so, no, thanks again. We might um, get you later on in the yeah, day once I'm we here. hit the marathon. Yeah, you okay. can give us your updates Perfect. and thoughts on that. And hope, great to have you. hope you see uh, CB. Yeah, me too. Me too. Definitely. Thank see you so bye much. Bye. Enjoy thanks, brekkie. Uh, it, it's always great to have uh, Norman around. He's just... He's, he. He talks about Sebi Kinlay being a great character for the sport and, and, and really being the face of the sport. But I feel the same about Norman Stadler. Uh, I know him quite well. He spent a lot of time training in Australia and I spent many, many training camps with him <laughs> as we say goodbye. He's, um, he's always been good fun. And what a lot of people don't realise, he's, he's a comedian. He's actually got a really dry sense of humour. Yeah, like, to be honest, I didn't know him um, much at all before before uh, the Collins Cup, but it was great getting to know him during the week and always joking. Um, I hope he was joking before about, you know, me and you, but yeah, hey, yeah, that's yeah, whatever I, I can, you know, I don't blame him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's a great character and I grew up um, in my early years of triathlon watching him race and uh, I always admired the way he raced. And, he's uh, incredible. Yeah. He's incredible. As we go back to the race course now, and just before we saw our leader, Annie Haug, making her way through the town of Hippelstein. Of course, beautiful little town. And I do believe that we have a little bit of a, of a clip on that gorgeous town of Hippelstein coming up shortly. Hippelstein is the largest town along the bike course. With just under 15,000 inhabitants, it not only boasts a medieval castle from the 10th century, 
but also a character very fond of the town's illustrious history. I was a night watchman for more than 20 years. Night watchman and guardian of decency, as we called it back in the days. <laughs> Our town is called Hippolstein, with Stein referring to stone, a huge rock our castle was built on. And even nowadays, people in the villages say, let's go to the stone, when they want to come to town. The Imperius castle was really special in the past. It was an important symbol of power in the region. And nowadays, the town has a lot to offer culturally, something highly appreciated by the locals. Hey, old friend. Do you actually know everyone here in Hilpolstein? Yes, I know all the bad guys. <laughs> I feel endless love for my hometown, just as much as I love the people living here. Welcome back to the Challenge Roth coverage. Back with the leader, Ruben. Looking smooth as always. We know his lead is out, getting towards the two minute mark now on our lead, on our chase group of five. It's still almost no wind out on course, which is just a crazy kind of day. Uh, you know, every day we've been here this week, there's definitely been more of a breeze. So it might come up later in the afternoon or we could just carry on to have this, you know, almost perfect, perfect weather. Perfect day, that's right. Only thing it's going to be hard on is obviously when they hit the latter stages of the marathon, it really is going to get quite hot out there. There is a good chunk of the of the marathon course that is protected, so it is shaded, which will be a welcome relief for many of the athletes. And speaking of our men's race, we do know that while Sebi Kinlay, we spoke about it with Norman Stadler, is over 12 minutes back now, we know Braden Curry, who was originally in that first group, has dropped back to about four minutes back, uh, just over four minutes back. So we take a look at our women now on, if, on obviously Annie Haug still leading. Fenella Language is now almost six minutes back, so 5.48 back. Kimberly Morrison it's sitting at 7.34 back. And riding very, very well with Kimberly Morrison is Sarah Crowley. So great to see Sarah Crowley, also coached by Cam Watt having a great race out there today as we see one of the last of our age group athletes making their way out of the swim and into T1. Of course, we had close to 1,500 individual age group athletes racing. It's about half on what we normally have here. We normally have over 3,000. And it's, it's easy while we watch the pros and, you know, if they all swim very well mm. but we also need to remember that for a lot of age groups the swim is the most daunting thing so whoever that was looks like they had a you know a long swim but i guarantee they'll be pretty pretty happy to be out of there and uh, about to jump on the bike and of course ribbon Sapunkte still leading our race here today looking absolutely faultless right now he is a little bit of an unknown because we just don't know how he is going to run the marathon. This is his very first time over this distance. We know he's holding approximately 55k an hour right now on the bike. So absolutely flying. And when you think of someone like Cam Worth, you know, he actually developed a pretty strong marathon before he developed like a fast, any fast sort of running. So Ruben, you know, he could get off and run, you know, sub three hours still and be competitive. So it all, it's all going to come down to how much of a gap he has. He is being chased by some phenomenal runners. Um, but, you know, with five, ten minute gap, he could really mix it up and, and you never know, he could hold on for a, for a podium finish. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it'd be interesting to see if uh, Cam Worth's out there watching right now because I'm sure he's very, very happy to see uh, an ex-pro cyclist leading the charge again. Of course, Cam's had some terrific races here where he's led, only to run down right towards the end of the, of the, of the marathon. But even I look at how far Cam Worth's runs come these days. I mean, the race he just had where he 
Well, uh, he won by quite a margin, and his run there was really, really strong. Yeah, sub 250 in, in, uh, in Denmark. So amazing run by him, and his run's only getting better. And, of course, uh, I think you know this young man, Jim Goodwin. Uh, great commentary for my favourite race, Keep It Up. Of course, Jim loves this race. Good to hear from you, Jim. Thank you for riding into both Dylan and I. I expect Jim will be up all night watching he, the race. I uh, guarantee he'll be, he will. He'll be very disappointed he's not here, but uh, good to have a message from you, Jim, and, and hi back home in New Zealand. Yep. All of our New Zealand athletes. We've got so many Australian New Zealand athletes, age group athletes that were planning to come over this year. Of course, international travel, very, very difficult right now for any of our athletes from Australia and New Zealand. But we are pretty certain that next year, 2022, is going to be a huge year for Challenge Roth. Yeah, I hope so. I hope for the triathlon world, next year is a, a big year. I think uh, there's a lot of athletes out there who have been missing their sort of yearly fix of racing. And um, yeah, fingers crossed for some smoother sailing next year. And, you know, even though you and I are here for, for work purposes, I, I'd be lying if I, if I said one of the main reasons I love coming back in particular to this race is because of the, uh, the friends that I have that I've developed over the many, many years of being in the sport. And one of the reasons I still love this sport as much as I did when I first started is the friendships that I've formed um, are absolutely precious to me. And last year, not being able to come to Europe, which was the first time in about... 15 years that I hadn't been able to travel to Europe to come back this year and to catch up with so many people that I hadn't seen for over 18 months or longer two years uh, to my homestay family for example who I I first came here in 2004 and I've had the same homestay family every single year and and they are family to me now they're not um, it just seems strange not to see them every single year All right, from Simo is away. Hi, Belinda and Dylan. Could you tell us a funny moment, a moment that still makes you laugh thinking about it during one of your races? Well, I've got quite a few funny moments, but what's it, yours first? It does say cheers from Christchurch. So, or ch uh, CHCH means Christchurch from where I'm from in New Zealand. So, hi if you are from Christchurch. Um, I've got a, a good one. It's not very pleasant, but it involves Joe Skipper, who's been second here a couple of times. Um, I was actually racing Joe in Challenge Galway in 2016 and we came off the bike together and we were running together and I don't think I'd ever really out ever really outrun Joe um, but within a couple of K he dropped behind me and I thought no way I'm not outrunning Joe this early in, in the race and uh, sure enough he came back up next to me and within a second I was like what is that smell? And he needed to go to the toilet. Oh, no. And there was no bathroom, oh, so he no. just slowed down and somehow went to the toilet in his pants. Um, and it was a windy day, so I had to, like, move, position myself around him so that I couldn't smell the smell running with him. Oh. Um, I don't know if that was appropriate to tell. No, but... no, it's appropriate. <laughs> We're all friends here. We all know what the sport of triathlon... I mean, Sorry, for, Joe. For all the great point parts of triathlon, we've got the ugly parts as well, and that's, that's the full package here. Yeah. I should say good luck to Joe. He's racing in Switzerland today, so uh, sorry to put you under some bad limelight there, Joe. <laughs> well, hopefully that doesn't happen today when he's uh, on the marathon. Let's hope he has a clean race today, huh? Let's hope so, yes. <laughs> oh, it's amazing, and uh, obviously... Let's hope none of our athletes out there today uh, have those sorts of issues. But unfortunately, with uh, long distance racing, it's sometimes out of your control and you just have to deal with it if and when it arises. But uh, great to see our lead male taking in some well needed hydration. It is getting warm out there today, so good to see them continuing to fuel up and hydrate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do need to hear your story too, Belinda, oh, so I'm, no, I'm waiting to hear it. I thought I got it. out of it. I thought, I, thought, I thought we'd get out of that. Oh, I've got too many. Um, but one of the funniest ones here in Roth was there was one point on the, the run. I was, I was heading down the canal, so the first section of the run. It was probably about 15 kilometres into the run, and I was having a terrible day. I was walking. I'd convinced myself that it just wasn't going to happen for me, that it was going to be an awful run and that I should just pull off the course. And it was at a section of the course where if I actually ran through the forest, I could get to my homestay family where I was staying in about two kilometers. So I stopped there on the course, stopped dead flat, and I actually had a conversation with myself. So I was two different people. One part was saying, don't be 
ridiculous. Continue. You need to start running again. You're just you're, you're being slack. You're being soft. And then another part was saying, no, no, it's just not your year. You're allowed to have one bad race here. So it was like I was having this little mini fight with myself on. One part was telling me, move off the course, you're a joke. And the other part was saying, no, no, come on, keep fighting on. Anyway, I did end up fighting on and I end up having a really great run coming back and I think I still finished top five. So, you know, I, I, I taught myself a lesson. The funniest thing was about a week later, someone had got the whole conversation on film. So I look like an absolute mad woman having a conversation with myself out on the canal on run course. I know when the pro women were running past me, they were looking at me going, has she lost her mind? Has she lost her marbles? Um, so, yeah, when I watched it back and, and saw it, I just couldn't stop laughing because I really did look like a fruitcake. Um, but very, very glad that I had decided to move on and ended up having a good run in the end. It sounds like a, a pretty common battle, but whoever's out there, if you do have that footage, we would love to show it. So please send it through. <laughs> not allowed, not allowed. What goes on tour stays on tour. That's, that's the way it works. But no, I've got some incredible, incredible stories, and that's what make, makes racing just so special. And we're just going to go to a, a little bit of a recap of the race so far. All right, so it looks like we've got a little bit of a technical problem there with the race recap. We will bring that to you as soon as we get it. Unfortunately, we have had news out on course that uh, Norman Stadler's predictions were correct, and it does look like Sebastian Kinlay may have stepped off the course. Is that the update you were given, Dylan? That's the update we have. Very, very unfortunate to hear that. But we just hope Sebi's OK, and uh, I'm sure he'll bounce, bounce back. Here we go to our recap of the race thus far. So a great recap of our race so far. Amazing to see Annie Haug still out in front for the women. And of course, we've got Ruben Zapuncta continuing, continuing to pull away from our professional men. Oh, I'm just gutted. I'm absolutely gutted for uh, Sebastian Kinlay. Um, we knew that he wasn't having a great day. Four minutes down out of the swim and continuing to lose time on the bike. Then, of course, we get updates that he went the wrong way for a little bit on the bike, um, thought he had his head back in the game, but obviously it just wasn't to be. Yeah, we've heard uh, had word that Sebi is out of the course, uh, off the course, and out of the race, which is a massive disappointment for him, of course, and of course everyone watching. Um, everyone does love Sebastian, so just hope he's he's feeling okay and doing all right, and I'm sure we'll, we'll see him back soon. So we get a great shot of Niels Fromhold continuing to race well in this chase group. And we have been given an update that Patrick Langer is now on the front of this chase group doing most of the work to limit that deficit up to Ruben Zapunkta. So great to see both Team Erninger athletes having a great day out there so far. Oh, I think it's all three because uh, Andy Dreitz is Andy Dreitz is up there Erdinger. as well, that's right, exactly. So you've got all three Team Erninger up in that chase group. 
putting themselves in prime position for the uh, marathon. Always wondered whether they had got free normal beer as well as alcohol-free beer because uh, that would be dangerous for probably for me, but I'm sure these athletes are a lot more disciplined than I am. But Nils is in an absolutely great spot here. Um, you know, he has had a, dif a difficult sort of season or two, and but right now he's he's in the box seat, and to have someone like Patrick with him, Andy Dreitz as well, these all three of them can run. Um, Peter Heimer, of course. I think uh, Patrick's obviously still in the box seat with his um, with his running legs, but between the other three, uh, it's going to be going to be a great battle. No, it really is, and I know we haven't got super close ups, but what I've been told out on course that the likes of, of Nils. Langer and Dreitz, they all look very, very comfortable. So there's no strain in the face. They're very, very relaxed. You can see that footage now of Mills from Holt. He just looks really relaxed. His shoulders aren't tensed up. He's in a great aero position. We know that he uh, has been, he's raced Roth three times. Uh, he had that win. He had the win in 2015. He was second in 2014 and third in 2016. So pretty good results here all round. Yeah, by and you know he's probably well on his way to another podium if he's got some good run legs uh and he clearly often does in roth so pretty pretty cool to see and i i don't think these guys are going to be too worried about reuben at the moment he's he's a bit less than three minutes up the road um you know i think they'd be happy with the gap at the moment and uh they're sort of approaching that 50k to go mark mm. and by this stage most things have settled down um and i i can see that group still sort of staying together until they get off the bike and you're right. I mean, we know that we obviously we've spoken about it. We don't know how Saponta is going to run over the 42 kilometres, but I'm sure the men behind are thinking if we can make sure that we keep that gap within or around the five minute or under mark, then that should be doable for, for them as far as the marathon goes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe Andy Dreitz have a have a crack at just um, splitting up that group near the end of the ride. Just to get um, a little bit of a buffer into T2. Yep. He. I'm sure he. You know, Patrick's got that ability just to get on get on his feet and just move so freely and fastly from the beginning. So someone like Andy might want a bit more time just to settle into the run and, and give himself a bit more of a chance. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see him have a, have a little go at some stage. And speaking to Nils Fromhold uh, at the press conference, one of the things he said is he would be happy with just being in the mix and a podium finish. So I think... Uh, he would be pretty happy right now because that's exactly where he wants to be and is. He, yeah, he's exactly where he wants to be. The only thing he would prefer would be if Patrick wasn't wasn't there. Wasn't there. <laughs> but uh, I'm I sure think every, that's all, all every of them, one of yeah. them's thinking that. Yeah. But Ruben is really he's he's attacking the course. He's out of a saddle as you can see, and and just up all, on the little rollers, he's really trying to get mm. that momentum over them. Um, He's kind of riding it like you would in a in a in a 40k time trial, you know. He's just attacking every little bit. So, be be really cool to see actually how fast he ends up ride, riding. We're going to take another one of our face Facebook questions from Nelly Bott. Hey Belinda and Dylan, when and why did you start with triathlon? I'm not sure I can even remember that far back now. <laughs> I guess I can start. Um, I was a swimmer and then always just wanted to be an athlete. I didn't know what kind of athlete and uh, just happened to watch the Athens 2004 Olympics and we had two Kiwis, um, Hamish Carter win the gold and Bevan Doherty get second. So as I was sort of sitting there watching it and uh, I had been a swimmer up until then and to be honest, I did not enjoy swimming and chasing the black line. I thought, well, hey, I'll, I'll give, this, um, give this a crack. And at the same time, I actually sort of watched the Tour de France. So I got a bike, started riding, um, and boy, was it a shock to begin with. <laughs> I bet it was. Oh, well, I started triathlon back when I was 21 years of age in university. I'd always been a really sporty kid. I started, did gymnastics till I was 18. And I, I was always a, a really competitive kid. That's why my mum and dad had to keep putting me into all these different sports because I, I, I just wanted to compete every day, all day. Um, and when I started university, I sort, of, I, I, I sort of took a break from sport. And I remember waking up one day and looking in the mirror and just not being happy with what I saw. I'd always been fit, I'd always been really healthy. And after, you know, two years at university, I'd let that I'd slip and I just, I did not like what I saw. And so I sat down and thought, well, what sport, what sport's gonna make me happy? What activity or exercise is gonna make me happy? And 
I'll be honest, I don't have a great attention span. So I needed a sport that was going to, you know, that I was going to be able to, to stay on top of and, and keep me interested and, and, and on the ball. And triathlon was fairly new back then and it just seemed like the perfect, perfect opportunity. I'd never get bored with it, swim, bike, run. And um, yeah, then the rest is history. But I do, I do owe so much to my now husband, Justin uh, Granger, because I was just doing it for fun. He was the one that saw the potential in me and told me that I should start taking it a little bit more seriously and actually have a crack at being a professional athlete, which I'd never really even thought about. And um, luckily for once in my life, I listened to my husband and um, yeah, 20 odd year career in the sport and, and still loving it as much now as I did when I first started. So um, thank you for that question, Nelly. It was great. And uh, greetings from Croatia. I know that Nelly is in Croatia on holiday. So normally Nelly would be here working out. She, she works here and she's a volunteer here at the race and she always works incredibly hard when she's here. But um, I'm sure I'll get to see her next year uh, in 2022. Yes, hopefully. I think we'll be seeing a lot of familiar faces next year, which should be good. It seems like you know most of the people asking questions, BG. So um... <laughs> When you've been around as long as I do, that's, that's what happens. <laughs> And I had, don't think I've called you BG today yet. So BG. there goes your uh, your Aussie nickname I coming love through. It. Uh, we said we've always got Aussies and Kiwis love giving everyone nicknames. I think I think we've got nicknames for nearly every single professional athlete out on, the, out on the field today. So as we get a great shot of Annie Haug, still riding incredibly well. They're now three hours thirty into the race. Great to see Annie still riding very, very well and still looking so comfortable down in that aero position. We, we spoke to her um, bike fitting bit, fitter early today and some great information that he gave us. And, you know, he's dead, dead on correct with everything. I mean, just look at her now. She looks so relaxed. She, yeah, great position. She's happy to be there. Yep. She really is. So uh, she's at the front of the race, so that makes it easier for sure. But... Um, you know, when you feel good on your bike, it's just so much easier to sort of deliver the power and you can tell that she is comfortable, she's happy um, and she's feeling well, um, so she's well on top of it. And we did just see an image of, I think that was Sarah Crowley, who looked a little bit uncomfortable, but I'm not sure whether she was just getting out of her saddle to, to climb up the hill. Um, but by all accounts, she's been racing really well so far, so I hope, hope all is okay there. Yeah, it's interesting. We haven't seen a lot of Sarah Crowley on the course so far, but the, the, the few images we have had have had her out of the saddle and out, out of the um, error bar position. Of course, it could have just been the spots that she was on the course. It could have been where she was riding uphill. But we haven't seen Sarah Crowley actually down in the error position looking as comfortable as, say, Annie Haug right now. We know that Annie Haug is through 100 kilometres, so less than 70 kilometres to go for Annie. And they, they have been telling us that it's getting a little bit more difficult for Annie now because she is starting to get a lot of traffic. So we know that it is a two-lap bike course here in Roth. And the only difficulty for the pros in the second lap is that they do get a lot more traffic. All of the age group athletes are out on the course. So right now we have just on 1,500 athletes on the bike course and, it, and you do it this is this is where you really do need to get, get your wits about you because you are starting to get a little bit tied towards the latter stages of the ride but you know there's a lot more riders on the course and you really need to make sure that you're aware of your surroundings and we see perfect example here of um, Nils going past but this athlete age group athlete sort of getting in the way of I think it was Peter in the chase but Patrick looks great he did there was a bit of urgency in his stroke there before his pedal stroke um, but he doesn't, you know, he's still in front of uh, Nils and, and and Peter, so he's he's obviously still feeling pretty good. That's great to see Patrick Langer really making the most of it so far, putting himself in a position when he gets into T2 to really strike on the run as we expect him to do. Of course, Ruben Sapunkta still leading over our chase group. It's at 2 minutes 50, which is still... Not as much as I'm sure Ruben would like to have, but it's still it's it's still a, a good lead. We're gonna... Could just show how well these other boys are riding too. Um, just they're really minimising that that loss. Mm. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if they absolutely need to, but they they are they are worried about those coming behind. So um, 
at the moment it's shaping up to be a great race between these four and whether they can they can reel in Ruben quickly. And we're going to head to a very, very short commercial break and we'll be back with you shortly. For everyone who loves adventure. For everyone who makes their dreams a reality. For everyone who aims high. For everyone who maintains a clear view. For everyone who keeps family close to their heart. For everyone who refuses to compromise from head to toe. We protect you anytime, anywhere. Protecting people. Now available online. uvex group.shop. Successful companies produce a lot, like this, like this, or something like this. In any case, they produce that. Numbers, a lot of numbers. Because with success comes a growing commercial effort. What entrepreneurs need is good software. From DATEV, because we create connections. Fast, secure, future-oriented connections between the data in the enterprise, the tax consultant, and every party involved. As one of the largest IT service providers in Europe, DATEV creates connections for sustainable success. Wie wird unsere Welt von morgen aussehen? Vor dem Klimawandel können wir nicht davon laufen. Wir müssen ihn aufhalten. There is no planet B. Invest in solar energy. And welcome back to the 2021 DATEF Challenge Roth, powered by HEP. We have Luke McKenzie in studio with us today. Now, Luke has been out on course since the swim start this morning. Luke is here supporting Braden Curry, one of the athletes he not only sponsors, but also is a great friend. So welcome, Luke. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, good to be back in Roth. Um, you know, haven't not been here for several years it's uh, really exciting to be back this the atmosphere of this event it's just second to none and I'm, I'm so excited to be here today now give us a little bit of an update Braden had a fantastic swim he was in the lead group for, for quite a while but we know that that elastic band just started to break and he's now probably sitting at about four or five minutes behind our leader uh, but more importantly uh, the gap between say Braden and that that chase group is actually starting to to get a, bit, a little, little bit bigger as well. Yeah, no, um, Braden had a great swim. He was right there. Um, Nick was really pushing the pace at times and uh, there was a lot of jostling for position. Uh, he did seem to get a little bit beaten up about halfway through the swim. Um, and he came out in a good position, uh, attacked the, the start of the bike. Um, you know, I was really happy with where he was initially, but um, it looked like around that 40, 50 kilometre mark, he really started to um, get stretched by the Germans, and now he's in uh, no man's land, unfortunately. So uh, it's going to be a long solo day for Braden. He's going to have to keep his head switched on. Uh, he's going to have to, you know, look after himself and, and know that he's got that run weapon. He is one of the best runners in the field, um, and so he's just got to get himself there. How is it out on course? You've, you've been out on the road. Um, you got Braden, I think, a, a bottle at some stages, did you? Uh, how is it out there? Are there many supporters out, even though they're not 
technically supposed to be? Yeah, so I went down to Greeting uh, and looked at the climb down there. There was a fair few spectators down there, but the, the conditions are spectacular. Um, absolutely immaculate weather, uh, not a breath of wind, perfect sunshine, nice temperature, not too cold, not too hot yet. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the course, there's, there's people over the course, but it, I, I remember from being here in the past, it's, it's nowhere near as the, no. the crowds that there were several years ago. And look, one thing about Braden, we, we know he's a phenomenal runner. You just mentioned it then. I think he's got a, a marathon record of about 239, as compared to, say, the likes of Patrick Langer, who we know has run about a 236, different courses, of course. Just like you said, he's got to keep his, his, his mind on the job. He's got to keep focused. And even though he, he knows he's losing time to the likes of Patrick Langer, he could still run down every single person in this field. Yeah, I mean, you know better than anyone, Belinda. I mean, the day is long. So much can happen. Uh, that front group will not come in together. I'm guessing that it will split up eventually. Ruben's really pushing the pace. And there's some guys in that front group that really look strained. They came through that, uh, I think it was 90 kilometers where I handed off the, the bottle to Braden. And some of those guys looked like they'd already had it. Braden. And uh, they've, they've got to get around another 90 kilometers at that pace and then try and run a marathon. I'm guessing it's going to get quite hot this afternoon. And that's going to really tell, you know, when they get out on that canal and there's not much spectator support uh, and it heats up, I think there's going to be some fireworks. How did Patrick look out there? Like, we just saw a clip of him where he looked like he was maybe forcing the effort on the bike a bit, but he was actually at the front. So maybe he is the one trying to split it up. Did he look look quite good? Yeah, so when I saw the group go through, Andreas Dreitz was actually probably five, ten seconds ahead of the group. Uh, almost attacking through that aid station there. And and uh, Patrick looked very focused on trying to get his nutrition, which is obviously very smart. He's, you know, it's not his first time at the rodeo. He's he's looking <laughs> he's after himself because he knows that later on in the day he's going to need that nutrition. And I, I really, um, you know, I paid attention to that. I, I thought that he was quite smart uh, in getting that nutrition in. And uh, so he was hanging back a little bit. Uh, but as you said then, and not too long later, he was pushing the pace. So I think he's in a great position and he's definitely the one to beat right now. Any surprises out on course so far? Yeah, I mean, obviously Seb Sebastian Kindler. I, I thought he'd be right up there by now. Uh, obviously, I, I heard that he went the wrong way, which is a big disappointment. Uh, I know he's a, a German favourite and one of my good friends too. I, I, I really love Sebi and uh, love the way he's raised. He's, uh, he's such the, you know, the such a great guy you know I've raced him all over the world and uh, I'm just disappointed for him that his day isn't going to plan and um, that we won't see him uh, winning the race today. We can both speak from personal experience here I think and not having a great day I don't know if you had a great day or not I don't think you did um, it's really a course where if you're having a great day you can absolutely make the most of it they've got the all the rollers on the on the bike those kind of more exposed areas you know, someone like Braden, if he's not having a great day, he's also by himself. That's going to make it pretty tough. Yeah, to be honest, Braden's having the exact race I had here in 2014. I, I was up in the front group and then just, just dropped that three or four minutes. And when you're solo on this course mm -hmm. and that German freight train's on the front, <laughs> you have got no chance. And uh, I think I rode about 4.12 solo here. Um, several years ago and I was surprised I, I must have come up off the bike seven or eight minutes down on Timo Brack and those guys and you know that it's so you know you can put in the effort and still be a long way behind and um, you know I think it was a very similar day uh, in 2014 when I raced here I think it was about 30 degrees on the run and it really really spread out later in the afternoon so I think Braden I think he's got the um, you know the know-how he's done a lot of Ironman racing now long distance racing now I think he'll know that you know he's just got to stick in there and know that that front group is definitely going to disintegrate at some point and if anyone can get the bit between their teeth in a position <laughs> like Bray, uh, Braden he's in it's Braden he's going to it doesn't matter how far behind he is off the bike he's just going to get off and well, and run as fast as he can it's interesting you say that because I, I can't remember what year it was exactly but I remember Joe Skipper one year having a terrible swim bike. Uh, everyone was shocked that he was so far back off the bike. I thought, I didn't even bother updating when I was doing the spotting. I didn't even bother putting him into the equation, even though I know he's a great runner. And I think he ran himself up into the podium. I think he ran himself up into third place. So I can see Braden Curry doing exactly the same thing today. Absolutely. I mean, if Braden can pull out one of those low 240 runs, I mean, 
he can make back 10 minutes on yeah. some of these guys. And there's going to be guys that, that totally blow up and might run over three hours in this front group. So uh, you just got to have that faith and, and race your race at this point. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm just always a bit nervous about Braden because he's very renowned for going out very quick. I think every single... Uh, Dylan would know as well. I think every single race, no matter if it's Olympic distance up to long distance, Doesn't matter. Uh, he could run that first kilometre in three minutes and ten seconds. Yes. And so he's going to try and make it up in the first kilometre. And I just, you know, I'm going to be out there in that first kilometre making sure... Calm down. Calm down you're not going to make it all up in this first few kilometers it's a long day he's going to make up that time in the last five to seven kilometers and tell us just a little bit about I mean obviously you're friends with Braden Curry he spends a lot of time training in Noosa from New Zealand of course but spends a lot of time in Noosa but he's more than that now too you you've also taken on a new relationship new sponsorship relationship with Braden can you talk to us a little bit about that yeah no I've, I've known Braden for many years now and uh, him coming to Noosa over the last several years is we've definitely fought uh, you know, formed a great relationship and I think it's not just with Braden and myself but our families uh, we've got very similar sort of families with you know our kids traveling around the world with us and um, that was something that was really exciting for us when we took on Braden is he's more than just the athlete he's a family guy and that's what we really love in, in him and it was exciting that I have the opportunity to be over here and um, supporting him because I know Sally dearly wants to be over here I've been texting her all morning uh, I know yep. she. <laughs> I've had a few messages so, from Sally too. So yeah, hey, hi, Sally. Sally. And uh, yeah, hugs. and full credit. It's the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. it'll be in the middle of the yeah. night when this this finishes. finishes so yeah. she's just up the, the whole time. And um, yeah, so it's exciting to be here to support him. And you know, I really hope he does well. Yeah, we do too. We do too. He's a favourite. Absolutely. We're going back to our race here on course. We're at about the 3.48 mark in the men's race and the 3.46 mark for our women's. It's just ticked over. Great shot of Patrick Lange on the bike. Still looking very, very comfortable. We know that he did try, just as Luke said, he did try to break that group up, that chase group up. And we know that both Dreitz and Baluk were the victims of that. We know that Dreitz has managed to claw his way back on. But latest updates were that Philip, Philip Bahilk was off the back of the chase group. We're not sure if that is still the case, but he may have been a casualty of that push from Lang. Looks like this is Nils, obviously, then Peter Heimerick and Dreitz at the back. So it could be Philip Bulk at the back of the group. Um, just managing to get just, back on. Just kind of hanging on there and burning a few matches probably the, at the same time to, to stay up there. It's also sort of around the point where I'm expecting that some moves will start to be made you know as you get three plus hours into the race um, especially the greeting climb coming up shortly uh, that 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 area of the course is particularly hard one of the harder po points of the course and also that descent that's just after there um, you know there might be some risk taking there to try and get off the front so uh, I wouldn't expect this group to, to stay like this all the way to the finish. Greeting's kind of like a 20 minute effort almost, isn't it? Where you really have to be on your game to um, to hang on. And it's going to suit Patrick down to a tee. Uh, steep little climb to start, then it kind of, you know, gets a bit more gradual, but you get the wind up there too, so. Yeah. No, Patrick's one of the lighter athletes too. I think that definitely helps him on the climbs. Uh, it's a bit surprising why when Braden dropped off the group too actually I thought that was a part of the course that was actually going to suit him uh, and also coming from the mountain biking background there's those few descents through that area where I thought you know that would suit him and that's actually where they pulled away from him so yeah it's um it's going to be a part that definitely suits Patrick here. Of course as we go back to our leader today he's led from almost the beginning of the bike ride Ruben Zapunkta and he just looks so good on the bike, Luke. I mean, he's looked like this all day long. Yeah, no, he definitely looked effortless as he came through. He, uh, you know, I've, I've watched from afar. I don't actually, I've never actually raced him, but um, definitely um, a top pedigree cyclist. And you'd expect this from him. Um, you know, he's going to need that gap going into the run. We know that he's not the, the best runner and uh, he'll be looking over his shoulder once he gets off the bike. So he's going to need every minute that he makes here. Um, but in saying that, I mean, he's making the race right now. He's making it exciting. It's what you expect here in Germany, yeah. Yeah. A, a German really giving German it off the front. On, on, off the front. Off the front on the so bike. Uh, they're getting their, uh, getting their wish. No, it's really great. And as you said, 
You couldn't have asked for better conditions. We were all a little concerned when it had to be moved to September that it would be a little bit too cold. Um, but obviously the, the weather gods have been looking out for us. They've, they've obviously said, you know, you've, you've put up with enough for the last 18 months. We're going to give you good weather, weather today. So what's your job? rest of the day, Luke. You're heading back out, well, back out got, of course. I've got really big uh, responsibilities on the run, um, trying to get Braden through the run and um, there's a few special needs points out there where he's got his lolly bags and whatnot uh, to be <laughs> to be handed out and I'm, I'm actually a little stressed about it. I don't, I don't want to mess it up. So um, yeah, I've got my little cooler bag there that I've just ducked back to his house to get and um, waiting for waiting for him to get off the bike so I can get into those duties. That is a great thing about Roth, though, isn't it? That you can have people give out your special needs at, at an aid station. So, stage, yeah, yeah areas. I, I just came from that aid station. Actually, there was yep. a lot of the pro um, partners and sponsors in that area there, and yeah, no, it's it's definitely one of the. Uh, points of difference at this race that you don't always get at other events and so it's nice to race with your own nutrition and be able to have those uh, supporters out there on the course at, at the crucial points. Yeah absolutely. Well thank you Luke, thanks for coming along. Good luck with that, uh, getting that nutrition out there and if you do have any lollies or candy in there you can... Over. Any leftovers, bring them back here because we'll eat them. Yeah, exactly. Long day no, ahead. Thanks for having me, I absolutely love it here in Roth and uh, yeah. Thank awesome you. to have you. Thanks Luke. Of course, Luke McKenzie, no slouch himself on the bike. Often, more often than not, posting the fastest bike splits at pretty much every race he attended. And I uh, think he actually owns a few splits still to this day at many races around the world. It's uh, incredible to have him over here supporting Braden. As we take a look at Lange on the bike, looking very, very smooth, great cadence. One thing I notice about uh, Patrick Lange's cadence, um, absolutely perfect right now. Yeah, it's a good sign of control. That was quite interesting. You can see Ruben Sapunkta looking behind. I, I'm not sure if he's looking behind expecting to see other riders or... But she... It would seem like that, wouldn't it? Yeah. He, he could have just missed seeing someone as a... As a um, as one of his competitors, I still think he's got that that lead. So, yeah, he definitely has. He has a, a lead of over three minutes now, so it has ticked over the three minute mark. Um, maybe he doesn't realise that he's got this uh, this kind of lead, but he was looking back there just for a bit to make sure that he couldn't see anyone. And of course, we go back to our chase group. Patrick Langer has been on the front of this chase group now. We know that it's just over three minutes back from our leader. We're going to take some more questions on Facebook shortly. Ooh, now this is a hard one. Lisa Owen. Hi, Belinda and Dylan. Where is your favourite place to ride? Wow. I don't know if you get to... I mean, you're from New Zealand where it's beautiful. I mean, everywhere you ride there is gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, I love riding in New Zealand for sure. Christchurch in New Zealand where I live has got some great cycling. Um, always really loved riding around Wanaka. Um, but, you know, honestly, probably Girona yep. in Spain is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, font Rameau and the French Pyrenees, just, just amazing. Um, it's really hard to pick. One I, place. I think if you have weather like this, there's many a great place. There it's is. when the weather's not so great that uh, you get those bad memories. So... Um, yeah, if I had to pick one place, it would be Girona, because they also do great coffee. So <laughs> good good cycling and great Perfect. coffee. Perfect. I, I would say for me personally, two places, Switzerland and anywhere in Switzerland, because I absolutely love Switzerland, and then also uh, Spain, and in particular Marbella. I've got some very, very good friends that live in Marbella, spent the last, the latter part of my career training there, and I, I've even said if, if my plane gets cancelled home back to Australia uh, in a week's time, I'm heading straight for Spain. So anyone want to put me up in Spain? I'm, I'm, I'm coming if my plane gets cancelled. Yeah, I mean, that's if, if I don't make my flight on Monday, um, I'll, I wouldn't mind heading to uh, Girona, I think. So I know a couple of guys there, David McNamee or Nick Castelline or even Frodo, if you got a spare room, mate. Um, <laughs> I'd lo <laughs> I love it. And we all know that Frodo does good coffee too. So La Comuna, uh, beautiful coffee there. So Well, he says he does. He yeah. hasn't hasn't proven it yet well, to us. So, that's true. Um, that's but true. the Rise On tent has been doing great coffee. So, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, big shout out here. to Rise On. Um, they, are my, they are a godsend every time I come here. I am a bit of a, a coffee snob. 
and the Rise on Tent do the definitely do the best coffee in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been almost. I think, I'm, I think I've been away about two weeks, so I was getting to that point where I it's needed, a good, twitchy, needed yep, yep. a good coffee and, and got that. <laughs> All right, let's go to another Facebook question from our audience. So uh, let's discuss Anne Haug from bo front bottle position. Oh, quite an unusual. I can't read. Um, it's quite unusual, right? So we're talking about Annie Haug's front bottle position being a little bit different to what we would normally see. I wish we had her, uh, her bike mechanic, uh, her bike fitter back online because he would be able to give us the perfect answer to that. Yeah. So it looks like it's, I'm struggling to see the screen a little bit here, but it looks like it's underneath the, mm. the aero bars a little Instead bit. Instead of on top. Um, yep. It is quite unusual, but I think here they've just had to be practical and, and put it under there because the aero bars are qu probably quite narrow. And really what you're looking to do there is just get it um, out, of the, out of the wind as much as you can um, and also keep that front on space as kind of as narrow as you can. So maybe it's not the absolute perfect position, but it's probably Where as it good as the they best. could get. Yep. Yeah. And still without um, getting in the way of aerodynamics. And e easy enough for her to, um, to, to get, it, get access to it there. So as you can see, an update on our men's race. Rubens de Puncta still leading. It's blown out to just over three minutes now on our chase group of Patrick Langer, Nils Fromhold, Peter Heimrich and Andreas Dreitz. A lot of black, yellow and red there. A lot. <laughs> um, the Germans are really turning up here to uh, put on a show and, and Peter's doing, doing the uh, Belgians proud. So I'm really excited to see... Um, Really excited to see how Peter goes. I know he's, you know, I've said it a few times today, he has struggled this year, but he had a great result in Frankfurt. He's kind of, that was his first full distance where he's really nailed the execution. So I think he would have learnt a lot there and uh, be great to see how he goes today. No sign of uh, Philip Bulk. He could be off the back, but he was riding strong. So he could just not be on that, that top five list, I think, and maybe still at the back there. There was a couple of updates that said that he was just starting to teeter off the back, uh, but it'll be interesting to see if he has managed to claw his way back onto that chase group. We know our professional men now have under 40 kilometres left to ride here today. If you're looking at the screen and saying, well, that just doesn't add up, uh, if you've just joined us, the bike ride here this year in the race is only 170 kilometres, unfortunately due to some extensive roadworks that were unavoidable. Uh, these roadworks are planned every year and normally the race is in July. Of course, it had to be moved to September and this is when the roadworks are always down to be done and they couldn't move that. So they weren't able to find an extra 10K section for them to do. So the course just for this year will be 170 kilometres. So our men, less than an hour to go, I would say, on the bike. Yeah, they, I think they're approaching that 40K to go mark, if not less. So. Uh... It's going to be great to see them all coming on the bike together. Um, part of me kind of hopes that maybe one of them does have a bit of a crack and just breaks it up a little bit, makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, I still feel like Andy Dreitz or someone who really is a strong cyclist could, could do that. Mm. Um, but then again, you're already this far through and if you've been holding on, holding on the whole race, by the time you get to 30k to go, you usually just hold on. Exactly. You, know, you, you don't work... want to change anything just in case. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. I know personally I would have, if I got to this point, I would sort of almost do everything just to stay in that group yep. um, and w almost worry about the run when I got onto it. Yep. Uh, sometimes it might take you a, a, you know, a few minutes to find your run legs, but um, I do think it's worth holding on um, and getting off the bike in that group. And this is really a point in time, obviously you need to have been looking after your nutrition and hydration well before this point, but this last hour on the bike is really your last opportunity to get in what you need to like prepare yourself for the 42 kilometre run. Yeah, absolutely. And the last hour is even more key because if you've already got some issues in the stomach, mm. um, you you can really struggle to get in what you need. But if you're also, if you're feeling good, this is the perfect opportunity just to get a few more um, stores in, take on a few more carbs and just be set up for that run to, uh, to, to make sure you feel, you know, as great as you can be. Exactly. And now just for our listeners out there, the bike course here, we know it's two loops, but they do two complete loops, but then it is probably about a 10 kilometre section from where they finish that second loop to make the, making their way into here, into T2. And I know a couple of times I 
just treated it like it was a couple of kilometres and dead flat, and it's not. It's actually a really difficult section. It's really fast to start with, so you just automatically put it in a big gear and you go for it. And then you realise, oh, this is actually longer than I thought, and then you get a little bit of undulation, and it's actually a little bit tougher than you thought too. So it is a good place that if you just want to get a little bit of a gap into T2 so that you can have it easy through transition and through the tent, it is a nice time to just you know get a, maybe 30 seconds on the, on the rest of your competitors. Yeah, it's again one of those sections where if you're feeling good, you can um, you can really make make maybe make the others hurt. Mm. Um, but if you're feeling bad, you're going to know yes. every one of those yep. little little, little rises. Now speaking about T2, we have Catherine Wallsurfer, of course, sister of Felix, and oh, here she is. I can hear her already in the background. Catherine Wallsurfer is actually in transition, uh, so she is in there waiting for our lead men to make their way into transition, and she's down with one of the or with many of the volunteers uh, now Catherine obviously uh, challenge Roth could not go ahead without the hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that you have here every year time and time again they are the most loyal volunteers I think of any race in the world hi Belinda hi Dylan um, yes that's true Belinda this is this is absolutely true and you know what um, they lost nothing about their passion for challenge triathlon here in Roth and um, it's it's so nice here you can see uh, all the bags just arrived from uh, the swim start and um, so uh, they get sorted everything and uh, in this T1 uh, in this T2 there are more than uh, 500 volunteers Wow, it truly is impressive. And as I said, I mean, this race could not go ahead with the support of the volunteers. And I'm sure it was it was really devastating for them all when last year's race had to be cancelled. But like you said, they have come back out in their droves. And I think if anything, Catherine, they're probably even more passionate about this race this year because they know of the hardships that you guys have been through. It's uh, interesting what you said, Belinda, because this is what I have just experienced when I came from the bike course, also with uh, all the spectators and the, the people who are living um, here in the country of Roth. It's a different feeling, yes, but they didn't lose any of their passion. They are sitting in front of the doors and making like little parties. And um, so it's, it's, it's so, so good to be back, Belinda, and everybody loves this triathlon. And you can feel that this year it's even more special. Catherine, just a quick question for me. How many total volunteers do you have? I, can, I, I can't tell you um, now. Uh, I think it's between two and 3,000, but we don't have exact numbers. Still. Oh, that's, wow. inc that's incredible. Not, not, really not yet. Yeah. Oh. The, problem is, the problem is that we actually have um, public holidays in Bavaria right now. So a lot of the volunteers contacted us and said, sorry, we are not here because we already booked holidays. And we just received uh, messages that, uh, that, they wanted to be, that they wanted to be with us and greetings from Italy or where they are. So it's, it's, it's really nice, it's really nice. And without our volunteers, we, had, we would have no chance to organize this uh, triathlon event. But I've actually been talking to some of the volunteers that are here during the week, Catherine, and they've said, yes, yes, we're on holidays, it's Bavarian holidays, but we chose not to go away on holidays like <laughs> we normally would. We're going to stay right here in Roth and we're going to work the race all day because to us that's what, that's what we want to do and that is like being on holidays. Yeah, that's, that's true. Some of them really stayed here or some of them came back earlier, which is really funny as well, Belinda, because it, it really feels... I just go a little bit more here. It really feels like a like a big family. You know that exactly, Belinda, and telling you too. Um, say hi to Belinda. Belinda's here in the stream. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, they're amazing. Honestly, I mean, I've done I've done so many races around the world over the years, but there is nothing. There is absolutely nothing <laughs> no. that compares to the volunteers and the network of people involved in this race. Now, one thing I really wanted to talk to you about, Catherine, is you came up last year when the race had to be canceled last year. You came up with dreams cannot be canceled. And I, I, it yes. still gives me goosebumps to say it out loud because it really was the most perfect, um, perfect thing to say at the time. And 
How are you feeling now? Obviously, dreams cannot be cancelled. You've proven that this year. How did you feel when that gun went off this morning? Um, my, my tears were running. My, really, I, I, was, I was so happy that, that we really had the chance now that to, to take the, yeah, to, 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 have, to host this triathlon event again, Belinda. Because last of the yeah one and a half years it was it was very very hard for us and of course for everybody, um, but it was a big 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 relief today when I saw that the athletes were really in the water <laughs> swimming and that the triathlon race is gonna yeah gonna take part. So we are really happy and super relieved, super relieved. Catherine, so obviously the volunteers are happy, uh, you're happy. I'm pretty sure the athletes are happy as well to be back racing. Has there been any standout stories in, in the build-up to 2021 Challenge Roth? Till now, you mean? Yeah, or well, any athletes that you've heard stories of that have been quite inspiring. Or I guess every story for the last 18 months is inspiring. Um, but any that stand out to you? Oh, Dylan, we have so many nice stories. We have um we have people who were who were really uh ill and, and and sick the last couple of of months and then just started to train in corona uh, because they're getting better and better and now they're racing stories like this but um also that um for example today we have got two proposals which is really nice as well uh, uh, two athletes and um, they are going to propose uh, when they are in in uh, at the finish line and these are the stories around the race, but also those small things, for example, um, at the bike course, when I see the kids and the children and the grandpas and everybody is sitting outside the, the house and everybody is cheering and clapping and they have this Bavarian beer. It, I, I do love that so much, really. I do love that because they celebrate sport, they celebrate triathlon and they simply love it. And it's, it's, it's different here in Rhode. It's it's really different. They they have so much passion for, for their triathlon and they are all happy um, that we are back. Oh, look, I, I'll, honestly, I've, I've witnessed it firsthand. I have never come across a region that has taken on a race as their own. It is, it is what we would say, it is an institution here in Bavaria. And I, I just know not only the people in Bavaria, but around the world when when it came out that Roth was unable to go ahead last year, I, I know I cried um, just because I know how significant and how important this race is to the region. But one of my best memories every year, Catherine, is when we get to the finish, when it's the end of the race, uh, when the fireworks um, happen and you, your brother Felix and your mother Alice, Queen Alice, stand together on the finish line and to just watch you from afar you can just see the sheer relief that you've been able to pull it off again how much more special is that moment going to be tonight a lot belinda when you talk about it i can feel that my tears are <laughs> Me uh, too. running again <laughs> um it, it for, for us um we, we we couldn't believe until the last minute um, of the organization yesterday night that this race is really going to take part because you know um, it, it's um, yeah it's uh, how, how do you say it? it's a very strange situation with corona and the rules they were changing so Never fast changing. so fast yeah, yeah. and um, it's for us it's a yeah we, we are so relieved I I even ha don't have words for that how uh, relieved we are so I'm I'm just happy when all athletes are good and all athletes are at the finish line and our volunteers are good. If nothing really happens, I mean, nothing really bad happens, no accidents, nothing. And then um, I think you can uh, see us three crying. <laughs> Crying line. and celebrating on the finish line, and I will be there with you. I promise you. I can't. Yes. I cannot wait. Thank you, Belinda. Of course, we've got a lot of great racing to go before that time. Uh, we have got a fantastic men's and women's race happening right now. Um, Catherine, you would be. You'll be happy to know that uh, two Germans are leading both our men's and women's race. So you couldn't have asked for a better case scenario. The weather is absolutely perfect. It um, is. It is. 
It's amazing. But listen, Catherine, thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. It's been wonderful. Uh, we're looking, no looking forward to seeing you here at the finish line later on this afternoon. No problem. Thank you very much, Belinda and Dylan, uh, for you, what Catherine. you're doing for, for us, that you're in the stream and um, love you guys. Thank you very oh, much. Love you too, gorgeous. Okay, bye. bye, uh, bye. Catherine Walshoffer, she's just... The, the Walsh Suffer family in general, they are just the most incredible people. Of course, their dad, Herbert Walsh Suffer, who's not with us today, but he really started this all. He was the man behind it all. When he uh, passed away, Felix, his son, took it on. And it's been a family affair since I can remember. And I only, when I sit in the office, obviously, when I'm here this week and I, I sit in the office and I look around, they treat every single one of their employees like family. And it's it's unbelievable. And you can just see that everyone just gets on with business. Everyone works so well together. It really is like a well-oiled oiled machine. And everyone involved loves this race. Yeah, just so welcoming. Yep. You never feel out of place or like you, you're not, you're not where you, sh you know, you, you're always welcome wherever you are. Um, they make you feel like your family. Um, and that's where, you know, Challenge Family came from, essentially. It was, you know, they were the core of that. So it's it's so cool to see that it really kind of started at the top and now that's the whole Challenge Family ethos is to, to, to be family. So uh, pretty cool. It is. And we've got a, lots, many of our Challenge Family race directors from all around the world here today. Some are racing. I know Juan and Fernandez from Challenge Salou is out here racing today. Uh, we've got, obviously, the CEO of Challenge Family, Yacht Flam, out there on course. Um, Tim Morea, who works for Challenge Family Core Team, is out on course actually giving us his fantastic updates on the men's race. I uh, always love it when Tim's out there on the motorbike because I know I'm going to get the most up-to-date and accurate updates. So, yeah, just uh, I was out running the canal yesterday and I ran into uh, the race director from Challenge Davos, Daniela, uh, and it's just great to have so many people here supporting what they know is one of the key events for Challenge Family. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, going back to Tim, I can't keep up with his. I know, I'm trying to keep up with his. It's almost like he is commentating the race just by <laughs> texting. So it's pretty amazing uh, to have them all out there and, and supporting the race as best, best bet they can. And of course, we're going to take a couple more questions from Facebook. We've got a great shot of Andy Dreitz there on screen. In your expert opinion, I like that they think we're expert. That's good. You've seen who um, Oh, Steph Hansen. Oh, Steph. <laughs> one of my favourites. Big hello, big shout out to Steph Hansen. Uh, oh, who's currently in, I think, lockdown number six in Melbourne. I, I don't even have words. What um, Victorians have gone through since this pandemic started has been unbelievable. But Steph, we love you. Of course, from witsup.com. Um, that is now, now no longer, unfortunately. But in your expert opinion and previous experiences, what's more punishing, the race or the after party? <laughs> hey, Steph, I think you already know the answer to that question, don't you? Because I probably could go out and race the race again tomorrow and survive it, but I'm not sure I can survive another after party here because they are, I'm getting too old for them. <laughs> If, I, if memory serves me well, which it doesn't from it doesn't. the after party, um, it's usually the after party lasts longer than the race. Which it does. It's a, it's a very hard, uh, punishing day, to be honest, or night the uh, after party is. But both the race and the after party are always great parts of uh, Roth. And it's a bit sad that there won't be an after party this year. Um, but obviously that's just part of it. And uh, it's just great to have a race sad, on. And we're missing you, sad, Steph. But, sad but good for my liver. Let's put it that way. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, obviously um, Steph's been here many, many times. Uh, she's raced it and she's also been supporting it with witsup.com. And I do believe that she may be one of the only ones to either equal or just beat Felix in the table run. And that's no mean feat because I think there's only been one other person in the history of table running that's been able to do that. So Steph definitely gave Felix a good run for his money. I remember that footage because... Generally, the footage is always so one-sided. Felix wins hands down, no competition. But I remember Steph, she got off to an absolutely flying start. Unbelievable. And I think Felix only just pulled her back kind of in the last right couple the of end. tables. Yeah. And uh, that was close. So maybe Steph's decided, well, you can't get any better than that. I'm, I'm, I'm not out. coming back to Roth. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And you're right. All The unfortunate thing about this year is, yes, we have a race and it's and it's it's... We're all thankful for that, but unfortunately a lot of the side events um, that go on before and after are unable to go ahead because of the COVID restrictions. 
but I think all of us are just so happy to be here and be out here, beautiful weather, commentating this race. And we know next year it'll all be back bigger and better than ever. Yeah, it'll be back to the 3,500 individuals, <laughs> I think, and the 500 teams. Um, it's just amazing. So, uh, But great to have today going off, and thanks to the weather gods for um, this day. Thanks to us sitting here yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and Steph, next year... Let's make it a plan to all get back here and uh, you and I can participate in the Challenge Women's 5K run because that's about all I'm up to these days. And then we can, uh, we can get that after party back. But thanks, Steph. And of course, a great aerial view of our race course today. Really is a spectacular course out there. Not too long to go before we start seeing our first pro male coming in off the bike. Probably another 35 40 minutes, do you think? Yeah, Give or take? Won't be far off. Uh, I think even maybe less. Uh, we're expecting around that 7.5 to 7.45 ra total race time. Mm -hmm. You know, if they someone runs 2.45, we could be pretty close to seeing them off the bike. So it looks like Andy Dreitz here has... Um, well, they're focusing on him. It doesn't, I don't know if that means he's, he's made a bit of a gap, but I wouldn't be surprised if he has tried to, um, like I said earlier, sort of mix it up a bit. As we can just see from my studio here, it is starting to get a little windy. It's the first time my notes have blown off the desk, so the wind is starting to pick up just a little, just in time for the run, which will be a good thing because it will cool the athletes down just a little bit because we said the temperatures are going to start rising quite rapidly as soon as we get past about 1 o'clock. Uh, and I think that little breeze will really help on the, on the latter stages of the marathon. Yeah, big time. And, you know, if there's no wind, and it's not a super hot day, but... If there's no wind, then that air just stays still and it can really heat up and you, f you feel it a lot more. So I think the breeze will be nice for them getting out on the out on the run. And Ruben's still looking super strong and smooth, focused. Nothing's really sort of changed with him. He's, you know, ex-pro cyclist. 170k is a long way, but he probably rode that two or three times a week in training. So he, he knows all about it. Um, one thing for cyclists, you know, they only ever ride 170k, you know, they don't have to run a marathon. So I'm sure he's he's got good coaching, he's learnt a lot, but it still takes a while to get your nutrition dialed in. And this is his first long distance, full distance race. So that could be an area potentially today that um, he, he, he suffers a little bit through. And as we mentioned earlier, it is going to be difficult. That looks like Felix Walsh suffer there, giving him a little bit of a shout out, telling him he's doing a great job, well done. Of course, Felix will stay on the course all the way till the first man hits T2. He loves to just get out there on the course, make sure everything's safe for the athletes, make sure it's a fair race for everyone. And he's always giving a positive, positive cheer to each and every one of the athletes. If I'm ever a race director, I want to be like Felix. I want to be, yeah, he would be a good person to look up to. I want to be out on a motorbike, enjoying it. I must admit, one of the jobs I did before I took on uh, the live commentary was I used to be the spotter out on course for the men's race. And it is, it, it, you're getting a bird's eye view of the entire race. It is such a great, a great job to be given. And I used to absolutely love it. You're, you're utterly exhausted by the time the race is over, but you're just, it's just such a satisfying feeling and you're out there. And I like to say these days that I live vicariously through all these athletes and it's, um, to be up amongst it all and to, to, to be watching them every step of the way in their journey to the finish line, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very special feeling. And Annie Haag just continues to build on her lead here. It's pretty phenomenal riding. Um, Fenella's still holding strong in second and Sarah and Kimberly still riding together for that third and fourth uh, spot. So Annie is just having a day of her life here. It's amazing. Unbelievable. But what's interesting to see, Dylan, is while Annie Haug is definitely um, putting good chunks of time on the ref rest of the women. The rest of the women, second through to fifth, are actually still reasonably close together, which is interesting to see. They haven't really dropped off. Great to see Kimberly Morrison and Sarah Crowley obviously working together legally to uh, reduce that deficit or to even try and pull in Fenella towards the, the end of the bike. Yeah, I mean, Kimberly's a super strong cyclist and she can actually run, run really well as well. Um, I think for me with the battle I really want to see is Sarah Crowley when she is running well she's a phenomenal runner and she has struggled with that I think this season as well so but again one of those athletes with a really good trajectory heading into Roth so um, 
between her and Finale will be interesting. And then Rach McBride um, is is sort of holding on strong there too. And, and they can run super well as well. So it's shaping up to be a good little run battle. And that's exactly what we want to see towards the latter stages of this uh, this race. I still have memories here of when Lucy Charles Barclay and Daniela Blymel were running head to head for a good chunk of the marathon and when they actually came into this arena. So the way the finish line is set up here, it's like a little mini arena and to watch them come into the finish shoot together and then they ran the entire way through the arena here side by side with Daniela Blymel just managing to get over the top of Lucy. I, I'm, look, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it. It has to be, even to this day, one of the most truly incredible finishes I've ever witnessed. Yeah, I remember that too. And it's not often you get, you get a sprint finish basically in a, in a, in a full distance race. And I, I know we have Daniela later to come in and, and we get to chat to her about that experience and then about today. And um, she's just had a baby too. So uh, we'll good to see when when she'll be back racing yep definitely on the comeback um and just yeah really lovely lovely young girl too uh another sprint finish that was of course it's iconic to this race is the big battle between Lothar Later and Chris McCormack uh that was another really really close battle and there's been quite a few close battles here but then you know obviously there's been there's been races where there's been big chunks of time I hope today that we get a battle on our hands I hope we have a running race in both the men's and women's events um, right now, if I'm to be honest, it's looking like Patrick Lange has got himself in the box seat heading into the marathon. We just missed the end of that, uh, that stat there with the uh, time gaps and it looks like Patrick was with Andy maybe um, and they've separated themselves from Nils and uh, maybe Peter. So uh, that's an interesting move and it looks like Andy did have a crack and he's taken Patrick with him. Probably the last person he wanted to take with him. <laughs> that's true. But uh, that's, that's just how it goes sometimes. <laughs> but uh, like Luke McKenzie mentioned to us earlier, he, he did want to see some of the men try and break away and split that chase pack that f chase pack of five or six up and it looks like it is happening now as we get a great shot here of Nils Nils from hold so it will be interesting to see what that time gap is now up to Dreitz and Lange and if these men are able to open that gap up before they come into T2 you can see that they are still on the second lap because once they finish this section of the second lap, they will then take a right-hand turn where they will leave the actual looped section of the course and they will have a straight run into transition. We're expecting about the Reuben to be off the bike in about 10 to 15 minutes. So it's sort of that, that pinch point coming now where they get off and you get to see how Reuben's running, how he looks. And of course, looking at Nils Fromhold, then he looked very, very strong and very, very good. As does this young woman, Annie Haug, having the race of the year for her. Of course, we know she hasn't had it easy all year, but she is showing no signs of the problems she had earlier in the season. It's often a, an advantage, you know, when you sometimes you have a slow start to the season and it's not what you want and you're a bit frustrated, but um, you know, some forced time off here and there isn't always a bad thing and maybe we're just seeing that come through now with, with Annie and, uh, you know, she had to have that time off in quarantine and if anything, it's got to be two weeks locked up in a room, it's got to be character building, so uh, maybe a bit of that strength, is, is mental strength is coming through now. Oh, look, I totally agree. It, it actually gives you time to just sit down and decide what matters most to you, where you want to be, and how you're going to proceed once you get out back into the real world. I know I've done it a couple of times now. Uh, quarantine, it is not much fun, but it does give you time to step out um, and step back and just really reassess everything that's going right, wrong, and, and, and everything in between. And so if you use that time wisely, it can actually be of huge benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um... I'll, I think I'll need to get some tips off you for my two weeks oh. in quarantine when I go home. Yeah, um, uh, this will be my third quarantine and uh, I think I've got one more to go at the end of the year. But um, yeah, there's definitely a, a few tricks to it. But it's, um, it, is, it, is, it is an interesting concept. But looking back here on the race course now, and you can still see there are still spectators out on course. Obviously nowhere near as many as we would usually have. 
But as we said earlier, this is such an iconic race um, to the region, to Germany, uh, around the world. I'm sure there are people around the world now watching this race because it is just such a special event. And you can see here now all the fans lining the streets, cheering on the athletes. They will be very, very happy that there are Germans out in front. As we see Patrick Lange, they'll be very, very happy that Lange is where he needs to be currently sitting in third place. So we know now that Nils Fromhold was actually up in second place. Yes. So it looks like Nils Fromhold has managed to gap himself just a little bit from that group. Pa Patrick's definitely trying to hold on here. He's, you can see he's over, you know, wiggling a little bit more on his bike. He's definitely working hard to keep um, Nils in touch. And uh, Nils, on the other hand, is saying, well, give me 30 seconds on Patrick, at least just to maybe have one or two K to settle into the run. Um, but Patrick also doesn't want to give him give him that time and he's he's clearly kind of working hard to hold that gap and you might think well what's 30 seconds when you've got to run a marathon but there is nothing better mentally than heading into transition into that tent having no one else around you being able to stay nice and relaxed relaxed not having to rush things because when you rush things to things through T2, you often forget things. You forget nutrition, uh, you forget to put socks on. But when you're in there by yourself and no one else, it gives you time to just stay calm, be patient and really make sure that you you leave transition with everything you need. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, for Nils, if he can get 2K, where he can just get his breathing under control, get find some run legs, that way when Patrick does come by, um, you know, it gives him a lot more of a chance to sort of maybe just jump on behind him and, and build into the run a bit more. There's nothing worse than starting a marathon a little bit out of control, um, not quite comfortable. You really want to be able to be comfortable before you have to lift in a marathon. No, that's absolutely right. And if you saw that part of the bike course then that Patrick Langer was on, it's there, he's literally at the beginning of the bike course. So that's where they get out of the swim and where they join the loop, the, the loop proper. And what he'll do now is he's, he's probably got another three or four kilometres and then he'll uh, actually make that right-hand turn and he'll start that, uh, that clean run back into town. So it won't be long now before we see our leader, Ruben Zapunkt, making his way into T2. He is very, very close. Talking about T2, let's go to a clip where we can look at what it's like for these athletes heading into transition. I think the longer the, the distance, the less important is the transition, but it's, it's free time you can waste, so you shouldn't stay too long in transition. In short course triathlon, um, you will definitely lose the race if you're not having a perfect transition. I think nowadays with a lot of athletes having an ITU background and they're moving into the long course, the transition times are actually uh, improving a lot. In transition area, it's key to know the runways. So actually you uh, have to know uh, where do you leave the water, where is your bike rack, where is your kit, where is your start number. I think in long distance we're seeing things, things are getting faster anyway and a second is a second wherever that is in the race over the, the swim, bike run or in transition so it's still really important that those transitions are pretty slick. It's more just about making sure you've got everything um, you've done, you know, you, you're not going to get a penalty by doing something wrong. Um, and you're in a good space to uh, get into the next discipline. And so I think it's important to just be calm, even if something happens. It's stupid to try to save, let's say, five seconds and not putting socks on, for example. That's not a good idea, then you're gonna uh, have bloody feet for maybe 20K on the run, so therefore you have to take your time to make everything perfect for a long marathon ahead. You can't win your race in transition, but you definitely can lose it. Well, extremely wise words from um, Lange then. Obviously, he is going to be coming into transition in the not so distant future. I think probably about 15 or maybe 12 kilometres left for Patrick Lange. We know less for Ruben Zapunkta. As we can see on screen, our lead female, Annie Haug. And now a full nine minutes back to Fenella Langridge in second. 
I have been asking for an update. Two athletes that we haven't spoken about so far this morning, uh, Laura Siddle and obviously Sarah Piampiano. Uh, we are trying to find out where they are on course. So it sounds like Sid's about 11, Laura Siddell's about 11.15 behind and, and currently in eighth. And Sarah Piampiano is 23.20 behind and in 12th. So definitely not out of the, you know, contention for a top five, even the podium on a good day. I know Sarah's got a run PB in the low 250s, so she can really, really mm. run. Um, and her run has been improving um, exponentially since since having a baby. So uh, be cool to see how she goes today. And then Laura, of course, is just a solid all-round athlete, and I think she loves this race. She'll always lift to have a, have a great day out there. And... Um, yeah, by not out of touch by any means. No, in particular with Laura Siddle, she's been coming here for many years now, and so she has a huge, huge following here. And she'll get, she'll be the one that gets most of the of the support out on the run course today. Just a little bit more of an update on our women's race out there. Everyone keeps telling me look out for Rach. So uh, they've been pretty much sticking to their own race plan, doing their own thing, uh, and not really too concerned about what's going on around them. So I know Rach had a goal of 3.10 for the marathon today. So it'll be very, very interesting to, to see how they can, how close they can get to that goal. Uh, we do know that Kimberly Morrison has managed to put a little bit of a gap of about 300 metres or so on Sarah Crowley. So she took a little bit, bit of a look back, saw that she'd created that gap and then put the head down again to try and uh, get a little bit more of a gap going. So Kimberly Morrison just managing to gap Sarah Crowley and then, of course, Rach McBride a little bit further back. Uh, good on Sarah, though, Crowley, for um, just holding on there and, and really almost dragging herself into a really good position in the race. And as long as she can hold on and not, you know, and minimise the losses to to, um, to Kimberley, then uh, she's in a great spot. Uh, and we also saw there just before the camera moved to um, Ruben was Patrick looked like he had closed that gap back to Nils and... He's just going to be on Nils as well, almost, I think, this whole way into, um, into T2. A couple of others we haven't spoken about were uh, Annalena Paul. Paul and um, Chloe Lane, who I think were around that 15 minutes back as well. So, um, you know, the difference between a good and a bad run is, is t could be 20 minutes, if not more. So definitely not out of the race by any means. Well, I still remember my very first time here in 2004 and I th believe I got off the bike with about a 15 minute lead and I was still run down on the finish line by, <laughs> by uh, Nicole Lader, of course, at the time one of the best runners in the sport. So you're absolutely right. Uh, if you're having a bad day on that marathon, then 15 minutes can be eaten up in no time. And uh, I don't... Just looking at Nils here, you know, he still looks in control. And um, Nils is such a great guy, and I've really felt for him the last couple of years. hasn't been able to have a great race uh, yet, so I'm really hoping to uh, to see some good run legs for him. And um, hey, if he can keep up with his Erdung and alcohol-free teammate, that'll be make it even more exciting. And he's still looking very, very relaxed there on the bike, but you can see. They have managed to put a good, a sizable gap. They are now heading into T2. So I told you before, they actually exit off the loop part of the course here in Roth. And now they are making their way into Roth itself. That is where transition is. So we do have a split transition here today. T1 out at the canal at the swim. And then of course, T2 is in town. Very, very close by to where we are now, the finish line. And they, these two men are well and truly on their way back. Now, as we mentioned, this is really quite a fast part of the course at the beginning section. But then as you get closer and closer to Roth, you do start to get a few undulations. If you throw in a little bit of wind there as well, it can actually be quite tough. But this young man not showing any signs yet of it being tough out there. No, he's looking, he's looking good. Um... And it's always a promising sign to be able to get off the bike and still be, you know, have some control left. So as long as he's been fueling properly, I'd expect Nils to have a have a pretty good run out there. And um, one thing we haven't spoken about in a while is uh, is Braden. So I'll be interesting to see how far behind he is. But here we got got Ruben off the bike first. 
Grabbed his bag. Of course, the great volunteers here making sure that he gets it as quickly as possible. And he's in the box seat right now. He's into transition. He has the entire tent to himself. He doesn't need to rush. He can take his time, make sure he gets his socks on properly. Because even, even things like putting socks on properly for the marathon, while the first 10, 15, 20 kilometres, it might not be an issue. You know, there's nothing worse than at the 30k mark of a run, getting a, a horrible blister on the bottom of your feet and having to run with that for the next 12 kilometres. Yeah, it looks like he took a bit of a moment there when he sat down. He kind of took a big breath. It's like, here we in. go, here we go. Yep. Well, you can understand it. I mean, he's never run a marathon off the bike before. This is the first time. So I'm sure he's thinking, OK, I did what I needed to do. I've got a gap. But here goes, here goes, right into the unknown. He's Great transition, though. Probably never run a marathon, to be honest. I know a lot of Ironman athletes or full distance athletes have never run a marathon until their first long full distance race. So um, he looks fine and... You're right, there's nothing worse than putting a sock on and it's a little bit wrong or even, you know, in a, in a grassy or stony transition, you should always clean the, your well, socks yep. so you're not putting your foot in with a little stone on the bottom of your shoe because that will just drive you nuts for a start eh, and really affect your running form. So, But he looked, he looked quite good just running out there. Yep. And isn't it funny, you know, you get into transition and, it, and you, 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 it's just so frantic and really you're talking about saving seconds over a long day it's 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 not really that crucial when you compare it to short course racing and it's often better you know him taking that deep breath maybe that was his time to just say okay calm down reset swim and bike are done now we move on to the marathon but we're just going to take a little bit of time here to make sure that we do it right and then we head out onto the run yeah big time um and i always used to sort of tell myself near the end of say the swim i'd be like all right the race starts now get on the bike then near the end of the bike Right, the race starts now because they are separate things. You know, you do have to change your mindset, um, get prepared to, you know, you've just ridden your bike for 170k here. Um, things are going to feel a bit weird, so you've got to kind of reset your mind. And uh, he, he looked good. He looked like he, he knew what he was doing. He really did. And looking at that day out there, Dylan, obviously, I mean, I know we keep saying it here, but you know, when you race in Europe, it's often it's often more miss than hit. You know, it really is. Um, I've I've raced here in in Roth when it has been 12 degrees, pouring rain, blowing a gale, and it's it's f freezing. Yet today, I you honestly could not have put a better order in for weather. So, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what that temperature is right now. But it, it's for for us sitting here under the umbrella, it's absolutely perfect. Yeah, it almost makes me wish I was out there racing because it is a sensational day and it's not really hot air temp I think it's 22 degrees at the moment um, but the sun does is packing a little bit of heat you know when you're out there in the sun it is it is hot so uh, it's not going to be crucial today that the whole the whole sort of heat thing but it can still uh, wear away at you so these guys are going to have to make sure they stay on top of nutrition and fluid and and, um, and yeah making sure they keep as cool as they can. But it is quite incredible I mean we started this morning at seven o'clock at 10 degrees and we're now at we're now at, what time is it? Uh, 11.40 and it's already 22. And we do expect it to get it up around 25, 26 uh, at about 2 or 3 o'clock this afternoon. So lucky for most of the professional athletes, they'll be done. But obviously our age group athletes, uh, they're the ones that are going to be suffering the most. They're going to be in the hottest part of the day here in Germany. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see how they deal with it. Yeah, I think for anyone that has raced here before, um, it can be super hot, uncomfortably hot. So... I think today, anyone that has raced in Roth before and then they're racing today, they're going to love these conditions. Um, tiny bit of breeze, but really it's it's quite amazing how perfect the day it is. And, uh, just saw Patrick Lange leaving transition. Yep, uh, Neil's just a tiny bit in front of him. Um, probably a good little psychological edge there, just to know he has that little little gap. Uh, what what I was impressed with with Ruben was uh, he tipped out his, his, his contents of his T1, uh, T2 bag and he looked like he had everything in order. He grabbed everything. He was cool, calm and collected. I know my first full distance race at Challenge Wanaka, I actually had a banana and honey sandwich in there, <laughs> thinking I'd be... <laughs> be able to tuck that in the back pocket. Thinking I'd be hungry and I'd want that. And I remember tipping it out and just thinking... What was I what thinking? What was I thinking? There's no way. I even actually strapped like a chocolate bar to my aero bars for the bike ride. And, um, so Ruben looked a lot more professional than I did in my first one. So he... Um, Keep an eye on him. I think he, he could be ready for this. Now, what's going to be going through the minds of Niels Fromhold and Patrick Lange right now? Obviously, they left T2 together. They know that they've got a carrot up the road to chase down. Are they going to try and do it as quickly as possible? 
and then you've got the other dynamic as well of them running side by side. Do you think Patrick's going to be like, well, I'm the better runner here, so I'm just going to play my game? Um, or will he be trying to get rid of Nils as soon as possible just so he can get into his own rhythm uh, without anyone being around him? Yeah, I think there'll be, there'll be two different mindsets. Uh, Patrick's going to be completely confident in this situation. Um, he's not going to be too worried about what Nils does. Uh, you know, if Nils holds on for 35k, sure. And by all, by all means, Nils can hold on. Um, he's def he's a great runner. Um, I think it'll be more interesting to see how Nils plays it and whether he thinks the pace is a little bit too hot to begin and just races his own race or whether he's out there to, to try and win and just go with Patrick. I think that's going to be the... Uh, the first thing we see is going to be it's going to be a cool thing to see. It really will, and we know that we know that Nils Fromhold has a, a, a personal best of about 2:43 uh, for the marathon, so definitely a very very solid runner. Um, obviously, on paper, we know that Patrick Langer is you know, quite a bit better, uh, but it's what happens on the day. It's how they're feeling off the bike. It's how they've looked after themselves on the bike. But yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing them uh, running side by side as we now see. Andy Dreitz, so Andreas Dreitz has now made his way into T2. And Andy's not far behind and he's he's a great great runner too. And def defending champ? Or defending champ, defending, yep, defending champ. champ from 2019. He knows yep. how to win and if I remember, he didn't have it all his own way. He had to still run pretty pretty well to win uh, two years ago. Mm. So um, he's going to be hunting them down, I'm sure. Uh, you know, we, we think Patrick's the favourite, but, but he, he's not guaranteed to have a great day. So he could have ridden quite hard and um, he could feel that later on. Now, I would say crazy to think, but it's not really. Four Germans, first, second, third and fourth, all into T2 out on the run. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's looking that way, isn't it? Um, I guess it's a German race, so that's OK. Uh, but we do get used to this in other races too, which is... Uh, not, not a problem, but um, the Germans are so strong. They love it here. Um, Peter, hopefully Peter Heimerich's not too far behind and he's feeling good. Um, and he might run himself into a podium if, podium if he has some good legs. And of course we should mention there is a lot on the line here for the Europeans. This is the European um, Long Distance Championship. So we the European Long Distance Championships today in Roth. So that title is up for grabs. Next week, we've got the World Long Distance Championships in Challenge Almira, so another very, very important title up for grabs. Um, do you think these athletes take it any differently when it is a championship event like this one and obviously next week in Almira? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to know. Um, I know when we race back in Challenge Wanaka and stuff in New Zealand, having that national title is a pretty cool yeah. thing to have. And it's not actually something you get the opportunity to have a lot in, in long distance triathlon. So um, I don't know if it will really cross their mind in the race, but I guarantee afterwards they'll, it's be, a little added bonus. they'll be like, oh, wow, I'm, you know, I'm the German long distance champion. And that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, German long distance champion, European long distance champion, while they might not be thinking of it now on the course, it is definitely a, a nice little extra boost. Yeah, sorry, Euro European, yeah. even better. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> As we get our first images of Ruben Zapunkta out on the run course. So it, as we mentioned earlier, it is an interesting run course here in Roth. It's road to begin with, so they will run themselves up to the lander, which is up on the canal. They'll then go one section of the canal and then down to the other section. So they go both ends of the canal. And the canal is, and what's the best way to describe the, the, the surface on the canal? It's like hard packed dirt, but it's still it's still quite slippery underfoot. Yeah, it's really light gravel on top of hard packed dirt. Um, it is, it, it isn't like the fastest surface in the world, no. that's for sure. Like you still have to sort of think about how you, you, you know, you're kicking up your feet and you're in the planting of your feet. And these guys are, you know, someone like Patrick kind of basically running on his toes. Mm. Um, you know, it could be a little bit frustrating for him. He could feel like he's losing a bit of traction. Very good point. Uh, whereas, hey, Ruben looks like he's He's moving pretty well, and um, this is quite a good sign because he's early in the run. Um, normally, it does take you a while to kind of loosen up and, and free up. So he looks like he's running not too bad. He's pretty relaxed. He's got his top open, so he's getting some air flow through there. Um, but yes, he's looking pretty good. And very interesting that you did say that about Patrick Langer and running on that, that loose surface because I, I had to talk to Marinda Carfrey. Obviously, Marinda Carfrey's raced here before. Oh, we have someone getting off the bike there into T2. 
little bit of a mishap when you come in a little bit too quickly and that often happens when you come in with others but that was Patrick Langer that came in so doesn't look like it's done any any harm no uh, it looked like um, Nils cut him off a little bit there not on not intentional no. uh, with those aero helmets you can't really hear much so um, he probably didn't know Patrick was right there behind him and and just Yep. Uh, threw his bike off to um, the great volunteers and, yeah, unfortunately took Patrick, Patrick out a little bit. But uh, looking at Patrick Langer now, it doesn't look like it has effect affected him one little bit. But you can see that he has got a beautiful run style, great cadence, quite a high kickback. And, and running on the canal, that can be of detriment. I know when Marinda Carfrey won the race here, she actually did not like running on the canal because it did not suit her run style. Whereas Chrissy Wellington, who was more of a shuffler, um, flew, absolutely flew. I mean, she still holds the run course record to this day in a 244.35. So she, uh, it, I think it really does depend on your run run style, whether you do like running on, the, on that so soft surface. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, to be honest, it's not something I can look at a run style and go, he's going to be good or she's going to be good. It's they, it's something they have to tell you thing. afterwards yep. that oh yeah I love that surface or I hate that surface um, and generally in long distance triathlon uh, it is a love hate relationship with a lot of things so as you can see Patrick has quite a he's got a real fast turnover and he's also got quite a good kickback but that could be something that is annoying um, on that surface and Looking at Patrick Langer now, let's just have a look at what he had to say about some triathlon secrets. Winning the Ironman in Kona 2017 and 2018. Sharks, which we obviously don't have here in the Mind Donut channel. <laughs> lost off my bike, so I couldn't find my bike. And I think I, I also lost the race because I wasn't able to, to find it. Be sure that better times are coming because long distance racing is a roller coaster. Um, you have ups, you have lows, and going into the race, uh, it is important to make sure that you get into the lows by accepting it and then working through it. <laughs> Sometimes I ask myself uh, uh, the same question why do I love running? Uh, a marathon after 180 Ks, uh, but it's just, uh, it's, it's in my genes and uh, I just, I can't describe it, it's just, uh, it's just what I'm built for and um, it's just what I love doing the most, it's hard to describe. And some great little secrets there from Patrick Lange running very, very well on the early stages of the marathon here. Currently sitting in second spot behind Ruben Zapunkt as we take you back to our women's race. Our women are now four hours, 47 minutes into their race today. Annie Haug still leading and increasing her lead over the rest of the female field. We know Fenella Langridge is still holding second place, but continuing to lose time on Annie, who is really having a spectacular race here today. Yeah, I'm really excited to see how fast Annie can actually go here. Um, you know, she's a on, a, on a normal day, she's a low 250s marathoner, so it's not hot, it's kind of perfect racing conditions. She could be someone that really flies on that surface, or she could be someone that doesn't enjoy it, but I think um, it's, it's going to be a fast, fast uh, day here for her. And so going back to our men's race, we know that we've got Ruben Sapunkta, Nils Fromhold, Patrick Lange, Andreas Dreitz and Peter Heimrich all in to T2 and out on the run. We are waiting to get an update on Braden Curry to see where he is. He has not come into T2 as yet, but we have got spotters. I know Luke McKenzie is back out on course now. 
with some special jobs to do. And he's going to give us an update as soon as he sees just where Braden is on the course. And looking at Zapunkta now, you, you can tell that he is a bike rider and not a runner. That's not to say that he's not running well, but you can see his, his, his cadence is, is nothing on the likes of uh, Patrick Lange. Yeah, he could still be running, you know, four minute Ks here, but when Patrick was flying down that sort of false flat at the start at 3.30s or whatever, maybe 3.20s. It's really not a fair comparison, yeah. is it? <laughs> so well, he looks comfortable. He's got a smile on his face. Um, he doesn't look too bad, you know, and he's just he's just got to worry about himself here. And um, there you can see the kind of comparison. Patrick's flying along. Well, he just looks effortless. This is, this is the Patrick Lang Langer that we all know and love. He really does look so efficient. And uh, back to the ladies race, we heard that Mor uh, Kimberly Morrison had dropped Sarah Crowley, but now Sarah's actually pulled that back and is uh, riding strongly in third and trying to um, trying to drop Morrison now. So a uh, bit of a, a tussle for third place at the moment. Well, that's really incredible to hear. And, and, and I'm really happy for, for Sarah Crowley. You know, she had some fairly major personal issues to deal with. Um, and it's not been an easy time for her. But from when I saw her at the PTO Champs in uh, Challenge Daytona last December, to, we fast forward to here, she's a completely different woman. She's really regrouped, refocused. She's more determined than ever to get back to where she was. I mean, you don't podium in Kona by fluke. Um, she was there for a reason because she is one of the very best long distance athletes in the world. Um, I know she's been based in the US now since then. So she's been in the States for a long time. It's given her an opportunity to remove herself um, and to really focus on what she wants and what she wants to get out of triathlon. And it's great to see her back. And I got to spend some time with her last week at the Collins Cup. And you can just see straight away, she's a different person. Um, she's a far more positive person. She told me she's starting to find a form again. And I think mentally she's just, she's got herself in a good place. Yeah, I, I never really actually got the chance to meet Sarah until last week. So, you know, my straight up impression was just a happy and positive athlete, uh, which is exactly what you want. And it's, you know, it's really showing through today. So um, good on her for just, yeah, definitely not giving up on that bike tussle and um, taking it back to Kim Morrison. No, it really is great to see. So Sarah Crowley, she will head back. She'll stay in Europe for a little bit and then head back to the US. And I think she will stay there. I think she said they're going to stay there until we remove quarantine from Australia. So she, she might be staying for quite some time. Yeah, we can hope. We can only, we can hope, only hope there. Hope. But uh, Patrick, just looking like Patrick. I can't really, you know, he's going to run 42k like this, and that's why it's so hard to uh, to count him out of winning at the moment. Of course, we did speak briefly about the run course up here. It is one loop, so they go up, they do a, a T section on the canal. So he's he's heading up now to what they call the Landy. So they run from T2 up to the Landy, which is right on the canal. You can see that Ruben Sapunkta is already on the canal. So they will head down the, right down the canal. They'll do an out and back section along the canal there. They'll then run back through the Landy again and out the other side of the canal. They will do a U-turn and head back. So it's a T section. They will then back, run back through town, through the town of, of Roth over the cobbles, which I can tell you from experience is very, very difficult running and then they'll shoot out the other end of Roth into the small town of Buchenbach. They take a loop through the main town there, around the little man-made lake in the middle of Buchenbach, before they then head back into town, back through the middle or the main square of Roth, and into this spectacular finisher stadium here where we are sitting right now. Yeah, and I think they've, they've actually reversed the first T bit, haven't they? You used to run out to a town the other way first. You and, did? Uh, oh, good memory. Yes, you did. You used to go left first and then out to the uh, out to the right, but it has changed. They do go the opposite direction now. Good memory, just not the greatest memory for myself. But <laughs> uh, I... I Going back to the run, I do remember 
that f the finish line seemed to take a long time running through town. It's a, you know, when it's hot and you're in, t in, a, in a town, that re you really do feel it all. So, you know, as the as the day warms up, um, you know, it's not an easy finish, and it and it it's not an, it's really not an easy run either. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see how these athletes ha ha handle the end of that run. And speaking of athletes, obviously we know, even though triathlon is an individual sport, Dylan, we know that it takes it takes a, a lot more than just the individual to get them to the start line, and, and, and more importantly, to get them to the start line injury-free, mentally in the best place of their life. And I think online right now we might have uh, Annie Haug's physio, Tobias Hermansdorfer, and uh, it'd be great to hear from him just to see what Annie Haug does leading into a race. Now... I believe that, uh, Tobias, you were with us at the Collins Cup last weekend. Yep. Gr great to hear. Are you actually here in Roth with us or are you at, in your hometown? Uh, right now. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for bringing me in right now in my hometown. and uh, I'm watching on the stream because, uh, yeah, just a situation with Corona. I want to show the respect and stay at home. And uh, I had the time during the week to work a lot with Ani, so I think she, she would be fine. Now, important question, and one I'm really interested in. Obviously, Annie raced last weekend, the Collins Cup. Um, she had a great race, a solid race there. What, what's your job? How do you go about getting her back in the best shape and position to now take on a long-distance event only one week later? Yeah, so uh, to be honest, we started right after the race in uh, San Marino. So we went right to the hotel back. And then we started with the first uh, yeah, treatment and recovery sessions for one and a half hours until late night that the legs are feeling fine again. The next morning, it was a Sunday, she also went uh, back on the first running session. And then uh, during the week, yeah, for sure, we had some freezer sessions to see how the body was reacting, how the muscle tension is, how the joints are feeling, but they were pretty good. And then, uh, yeah, we had another weight session, like to bring in the, the power back in the legs and bring in the nerve system that she's she ready for today. I was going to ask, you know, how has she recovered? But clearly she's recovered amazingly. Um, are you all surprised to see how she's going today? Uh, today, honestly not, because I, I know, like, after some reason, she, she wanted, actually, she wanted to finish in first place. She was second, okay, but then I saw in her eyes, like, she wants to bounce back, especially it was a, a couple of hard weeks. Um, and so it's, that's what's about in sports, like, how you bounce back. And uh, she was... Right after Summerine, she was really motivated. I mean, Roth is like an epic race here in Germany. And uh, you could see her mindset and her body was reacting great. So I mean, today is a really, really good race. I didn't expect it that good, but I know <laughs> she's able to perform. Look, I have to admit, you, we all know what a star athlete Annie Haug is. And, and there's no doubt that all of us expected her to dominate uh, the marathon. But for her to come out and dominate from the, the beginning stages of the bike, I mean, it's even blown me away. And it looks like what we say, all the stars are aligning and she really is having a, a perfect race day. Like she has, I mean, I think the, the bottom line was uh, how she came out from the swing, uh, from the swimming position. Like her, her swim was really good. Uh, she looked really good. Um, also the, yeah, the mentally part as she went out, you could see she's really, really into it today. And as she went on the bike, started like roll out and you could see okay today is the day for some for whatever reason today is the day yeah absolutely she this is i've said this earlier in the, the coverage that this course is a course where if you can have a great day you will have a great day because it it just lends itself to it's like a momentum course you know if you can take momentum over the hills and into the corners and around the course it's just it's just amazing and it's, yeah it's just great to see you having a great day i was going to ask in, in a normal week, how often are you looking after or treating Annie and how much goes into her normal week uh, recovery-wise? Like in a normal week, I mean, we see each other like uh, like two to three times for like hitting the weights and your iron, bring some athletic parts in and then it's also up like how she's feeling depending on physio. And I think that's a good thing that we can uh, bring the physio part and the performance part um, for me and one person because I know on a daily basis like how she's feeling, how we can react how we can adjust how we can execute but uh, so we are in touch on a, on a daily base and so we really have a really really effective recovery standpoint for her and you can see like in this week it was really intense what we have talked and uh, yeah and today we see the result 
And does Annie have a weekly uh, routine that you've written out for her? Because obviously, if she can't see you every day, is there a weekly routine or a daily routine that you, you, that you set for her to do? Um, like my part is the strength and conditioning part. Um, so we have a, a weekly routine for that. Uh, and I'm also always in touch with the coaches, with the swim coach, with Dan Loram uh, for sure. And then we set up uh, for the goals for GF and triathlon. Because my part is it's just the strength and conditioning part. But then we set up a weekly routine. But we also can like add, add special stuff if we need. Yeah, great. I think um, you've raised a really good point here that, you know, recovery or performance, it's, it's all tied together. So you being able to do the, the strength side, but also being on top of the recovery and say the, the more the physio side is, is so important and being having you there across it all um, has clearly or clearly is working very well today. And uh, so, yeah, hey, thanks for um, joining us, Tobias. It's been great to have you on and um, great to see Annie having such a great day. Okay, yeah, thank you. Wow, really interesting. But you know what? What I've taken away from Tobias and what he said, this is the last section where he's in communication with her coach, um, obviously with her entire internal team. Um, and it's amazing because it is that, it's that combination of working together as a whole to produce what we're seeing out on the race course right now. Yeah, super important. And as triathlon gets a bit more mainstream, you see these athletes building bigger, stronger teams and... Uh, it's all very well having a big, strong team, but if they don't communicate well, it's, it's just not going to work. So um, great to see Annie has, has that team together and communication obviously going really well. So, And, I, and I, I'll be honest, it, it seems to be the German athletes that have started this trend. I mean, you look at the likes of Jan Fredino, he doesn't travel anywhere now without his physio, without his, his bike mechanic, his, uh, who's here, of course, in Roth. Um, he has that group that travels everywhere with him. So they're, they're just making sure that there's no stone unturned, that everything that they can possibly do to get themselves on that start line in the mo most perfect shape as possible, that's what they'll do. Yeah, yeah, and, and Patrick's another one. We've just seen Patrick overtake Ruben for the, the lead here. So um, a lot of athletes have learnt from the best and Jan is the best. And uh, he shows how important it is to have a good team and uh, more and more athletes are building those teams now. And, um, you know, Patrick went past Ruben relatively quickly, but not didn't look too bad. So Ruben's still probably moving pretty well. It's just that Patrick is the, a phenomenal runner and um, he's flying along at the moment. Well, I do know that, uh, talking of Patrick Langer, who is now leading our race here today, we know that his coach is also here, Bjorn Gisman, and we are hoping to get him on the show, so get him on here live to get his thoughts. But I'm sure right now Bjorn is very, very happy with how things are going, um, to be leading the race this early into the marathon. Um, yeah, he's exactly where he wants to be. Absolutely, in the, in the box seat. And um, I think Bjorn will be able to tell us that Patrick knows how to run a marathon. It's going to be, it's everyone else's challenge at the moment to try and to try and run him down. It's not really Patrick's race to lose. Of course, what would be going through Ruben Zapunkt's head? Obviously, he knows that he had very, very accomplished fast runners behind him. So he probably had in his mind, well, it is only a matter of time. But what would he be focusing on now? Obviously, Nils Fromhold is not that far behind again. And then you've got the likes of Andreas Dreitz, Peter Heimrich, uh, all great runners. So what is, what is, how do you reset your mind now to say, OK, well, I'm no longer leading the race. I've got some fast runners coming from behind. Do I just try and maintain what I've got? How hard is it mentally to stay on top of your game? Yeah, yeah, very hard. Um, it all depends on what he came in expecting. And it could have started with him off the bike. He might have thought, I wanted 10 minutes, and he had three. So he's had to reset there. It all depends on how many times you can reset and, you know, change your mindset to, to then go for that goal. You know, it's really like a plan A, B, C, D. And as everyone passes you, it kind of goes to the next plan. So I, I'm sure he's thinking podium right now. Um, and that will keep him, a podium is an amazing result, so that'll keep driving him. Um, when it will get tough is maybe if he loses that podium spot and uh, he's just got to hang tough and because it's not over till it's over, right? So even if he's in fourth, there's still a chance that someone in front of him kind of blows up and so he's just got to keep fighting. And of course our professional men and women today, prize purse here is 62,000 euro, so that's about 75,000 US dollars, playing first to tenth. So they do pay the top 10 here. So that's a little bit more motivation to keep going, to stay inside that top 10. 
And we saw a good shot of Fenella there. She's still looking strong, holding second place. Um, I think it was about 10 minutes behind now, so it's blown out. It is blowing. It, it's not blowing out. It is getting bigger, but, uh, you know, 10 minutes, I expect that lead probably be around the 11-minute mark off the bike. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, interesting to see her pushing quite a bigger gear, but that's just the way Fenella rides, um, whereas Annie's definitely got that higher cadence and has just maintained that for the whole almost 170k now, so really impressive. And of course, Vanilla Langridge, this is only her second ever attempt at this distance. So definitely one of our least experienced females on course today. Vanilla had a fantastic race late last year at the PTO Champs in Challenge Daytona, where I've told her she has the best finish line pitcher ever. Um, it was a great finish, uh, finished in sixth place and has a yeah, really, really cool finish photo. Big smile on her face. As you can see, Patrick Langer here leading. You can see through the transition, er sorry, the um, drink transitions area that he's uh, getting loads of hydration in. It is getting hot out there on the canal. So he did take in quite a few cups of water and electrolytes. Great thing about the canal is there, there are some shaded areas. It's not a lot of shade, but there are definitely some areas where the trees do overhang, providing just a little bit of shade, which will become very important towards the end of the marathon. It is a run too that can can sort of wear away on you when um, it's just one big lap, you know. So it's great that they do have sort of out and back, so you do get a check on the other athletes. But um, I know personally, I used to prefer sort of like a at least a two lap course, just so you could you could break it down a bit more in your mind. Then uh, it's you can definitely do that on this course too. But uh, the one big lap sometimes a bit more daunting. We see Fenella Langridge still looking good, still down on her bars. Definitely a much slower cadence than Annie Haug, but that is, like you said, just the difference in their riding styles. Starting to see a little bit more sort of side to side from, um, from Annie, but not too bad. And Patrick just looks like he might have dropped something near or picking something up. So he's now made the first turn down the end of the canal. So that's the first turn at one end. He'll now head back to the landing and make a turn at the other end. Quite a long straight that, isn't it, out the back there? Very long. This section, actually this, for me personally, this was the worst section of the course. So this is probably the longest straight section that they'll make now along the canal. And there are quite a few sections on this course now where it gets a little bit lonely particularly this year when we don't have as many spectators out on course. Don't think we saw Nils go through there either, so it looks like he's put a decent gap on Nils quite early on. So we do know that Nils Fromhold, Andy Dreitz and Peter Heimrich are definitely up on the landy and on the canal, but it looks like Patrick Langer has definitely well and truly dropped Fromhold. It will be good to get a split. We'll be able to get a split back to those men shortly. As you can see, Annie Haug starting to take her feet out, getting prepared to enter T2. So getting it done earlier rather than later. They've got time now. Slightly, down, slightly downhill in this last section, this very last section into T2. So giving herself enough opportunity so that she's uh, got time to dismount a bike. Of course, the dismount line wants to make sure that she dismounts before that. She makes a right hand turn here now into under the Datef big green banner. Here she is coming into T2 now. Not losing any time heading in there either. It's a great transition so far from Annie Haug. Hands a bike off to one of the volunteers and she'll make her way into the transition tent does not look like no, she no. just rode 170k. Oh. 
Already got a great cadence going. Quite a bit of urgency there too, which just shows how determined she is to make this one stick. Again, she's in the box seat here in transition. First woman in, has the whole transition to herself. Actually managed to catch either one of the tail end pro athletes or one of the sub niners. Of course, they went off in the first wave with our pro men. So we have a lot of our very fast age group athletes, our sub nine athletes who are able to start with our professional men. So woman race time 5.09. She runs a three hour marathon. That's an, an 8.09. <laughs> Bike's only 10k short, which is you know, maybe about 15 minutes at 40k an hour. So this is a pretty sensational you know, race all round and would have, been, would have been amazing to see her on a full 180k oh, bike course. Absolutely. So. Now we know the, the run record for this particular course, like I said, the run course uh, changed back in 2018 and the run course record is held by Lucy Charles Barclay from when she won in 2019 and it sits at 259.42. Now uh, I definitely know that Annie Haug will break that time. I know, I, I know I've been told not to give bold predictions like that so early on but I, uh, I think we're fairly safe in saying that that record should be broken but it will be really interesting to see what that final time is yeah I think well she's probably going to go sub eight hours so I know it's 10k bike short but um still a pretty impressive uh, day out there by Annie that's for sure well, Two, 244 though I'm not that's an absolutely incredible run time by Chrissy and she was a phenomenal athlete so uh, it'll be cool to see how, how close yeah, she can get to that. And of course, we do know that the new run course here is a lot slower uh, than the old course. But nonetheless, it will be interesting to see how close Annie Haugen is. As you look at her now, looking very much like Patrick Langer, completely in control. Beautiful turnover. And like you said, usually, you know, those beginning one or two kilometres that you're all you're stiff in the lower back, you don't feel so good. It takes you just that that little bit amount of time to just for everything to loosen up, but both Patrick Langer and Annie Haug have not shown that at all, straight into business. So definitely gonna keep an eye on Annie's split times. And I'll tell you one thing we will do, once we get to the end of this marathon, I'll be asking uh, Torsten to weave his magic and let us know what sort of time she would have done if it was over the uh, full one and 180 kilometre bike ride. As we see Fenella Language now making her way into T2, we are going to head to a short commercial break and be back with you shortly. For everyone who loves adventure. For everyone who makes their dreams a reality. For everyone who aims high. For everyone who maintains a clear view for everyone who keeps family close to their heart. For everyone who refuses to compromise from head to toe, we protect you anytime, anywhere. Protecting people. Now available online, uvex-group.shop.
Successful companies produce a lot, like this, like this, or something like this. In any case, they produce that. Numbers, a lot of numbers. Because with success comes a growing commercial effort. What entrepreneurs need is good software. From DATEV, because we create connections. Fast, secure, future-oriented connections between the data in the enterprise, the tax consultant, and every party involved. As one of the largest IT service providers in Europe, DATEV creates connections for sustainable success. Wie wird unsere Welt von morgen aussehen? Vor dem Klimawandel können wir nicht davon laufen. Wir müssen ihn aufhalten. There is no planet B. Invest in solar energy.